Good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order at 10 a.m. As many of you know, the governor has recently signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Chicago Plan Commission, determine that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is nor practical nor prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I am making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. Similarly, I am also making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago Plan Commission or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the January 19, 2023 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to ask everyone that because we are meeting virtually, please be mindful of your surroundings. And in terms of noise, please remember to keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live streamed for public viewing. Lastly, if, you're not, if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will, will cause audio interference. Thank you. I want to also provide guidance quickly to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony for the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the plan commission today should have already submitted testimony forms, which included the speaker's full name and address, as well as the public hearing item number and those forms have been gathered by the staff. I would also like to remind our presenters to please be mindful of their presentation length and to please stay on point in a concise and efficient manner so as to respect the time of all in attendance. Out of respect for others, speakers should please limit your comments to three minutes. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make your comments. Please attempt to refrain from repeating comments that have already been made by previous speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of the staff or the applicant, but, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. Out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers. Any individual who disrupts the presentation or any subsequent comment session may be muted and removed from the virtual hearing session. Uh, we will now call the roll. Commissioner Barclay. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Viaggi. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Brunfield? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Not here yet. Commissioner Cox? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Not here yet. Commissioner Flores, present. Uh, Commissioner Garza? Not here yet. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lightfoot? Not here. Commissioner Lyons? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Not here yet. Commissioner Novada? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Osterman? Not here yet. Commissioner Pinedo? Not here. Commissioner Reyes? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Soto? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Esposado? Not here. Commissioner Tillman? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Villegas? Not here yet. And Commissioner Wagensback? Here. Thank you. We will now approve the minutes from the December 12, 2022 regularly scheduled plan commission meeting. The minutes were distributed prior to today's hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission held on December 12, 2022? So moved, Novara. 
Thank you. Motion by Commissioner Navarra. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Wiggins Pack. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Viaggi? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brunfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Still not here. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Soto? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Wagensback? Yes. And I see that Commissioner Escareño is here. Would you like to take a vote on this? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. We have one item for which we are seeking a deferral. That is item D1, uh, the We Will Chicago Plan. Do I have a motion to defer item D1 to a date certain of February 16, 2023? So, so moved. Move. Second. So moved by Commissioner Lyons, and I have a second by Commissioner Viaggi. Yes. Thank you. Um, roll call vote. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Viaggi was yes. yes. Can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Escareño. Yes. Thank you. Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Soto. Yes. Commissioner Tillman. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Thank you, and Commissioner Wagons back. Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Uh, so item will be deferred to next month's agenda. Uh, we will now take public testimony for the items remaining on the agenda today. We have received speaking forms from two individuals for items on today's agenda. The first speaker is Mr. Butler Adams to speak on items D4. Um, and the second is Ms. Linda Gonzalez to speak on item D3 at 2800 East 106th Street. Mr. Butler Adams. Good morning. Um, can you all hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yeah, good morning. My name is Butler Adams. I just want to make a quick comment on uh, item number four, which is for the elevated trail. And I'm liking the fact that we're doing these here in Chicago. There's one plan for Inglewood as well. And uh, I've been on the High Line number, numerous times in New York City. And one thing that I like about the High Line over the past 10, 15 years is all the great architecture that has kind of popped up uh, right along that particular trail in Manhattan, which is really, re really, really cool. And if you haven't been there over the past few years, I certainly uh, encourage people to visit it once again. Uh, one thing about this trail that I'm curious about is, uh, is the same thing going to be done here that was done in Humboldt Park. Um, up there, there was kind of a, a there was a moratorium kind of put in place in terms of demolitions. Now, there are a lot more vacant lots around this particular trail than the other one, but I'm sure that there's going to be some concern about gentrification around this particular trail, like there was around the 606 trail. I was kind of curious if some of the same steps were going to be taken so that people don't get kind of forced out of their homes. Uh, so they, you know, uh, similar to the 606 trail. I'm also hoping that there's some upzoning along this line to allow for more density um, and more verticality. And also, again, like I said, uh, I've been to the High Line numerous times, all that great, not necessarily contemporary architecture, but futuristic architecture, just great designs is something that I'm looking for. Um, and I also hope that the city is looking at some of the existing elevated embankments, not necessarily just for more trails like we have right now, but I will also, you know, just for the future, is there any way to possibly extend public transportation? Not necessarily, you know, having an L up there, but, you know, light rail or, you know, uh, other than some, something other than just bike paths. But this is, I think, 
a good step in adding green space to areas that are certainly lacking in green space. But I do hope that some of the, the same steps are taken around this particular trail as, again, the 606, so that folks don't get pushed out of the area. And just for one more time, I'm certainly hoping for great architecture on the vacant lots and more upzoning. I want to see some more B3-5s in these neighborhoods. But that's all that I have right now, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, next is Ms. Uh, Linda Gonzalez. Thank you. Hi, this is Linda Gonzalez from the People's Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, I am also a community partner of Alliance of the Southeast. And I'm calling to say that I strongly oppose the proposed zoning amendment that would allow for truck and container storage at 2800 East 106th Street at the Calumet River. Um, the application to rezone the site uh, to a waterway industrial plan development for vehicular storage um, does not meet, you know, the Calumet design guidelines. Uh, there were no uh, air or traffic study that was submitted uh, in the application for the public to review. There were no, um, there was no community meeting held uh, in the ward as required uh, by uh, the, the zoning ordinance. And um, there were no signs that were published around the site to let people know about this rezoning. And, you know, the application that was submitted, uh, the copies there about the notices to the property owners surrounding were dated from uh, July of last year. So, uh, or June of last year. So, um, you know, so that it doesn't meet any of the notification requirements. And, um, you know, basically, we, we oppose this. We feel like we need to have a right to know what exactly the use is going to be. Um, when it says on the um, site plan that there, it says that there's a zero setback at the northeast corner uh, to allow for industrial development. When another part of the application says that this is a non-dependent, uh, non-dependent uh, waterway development. So, uh, so it's very unclear. There's a lot of information that's missing. Uh, people are just starting to find out about this last week and are really outraged about it. So. Um, I urge the uh, the committee to oppose um, approval for this um, amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, do we have any other members of the public who wish to make comments at this time? Please raise your hand in the Zoom window and we will call your name in the order that they appear. We'll give you a few seconds. Okay, well, when we have Butler Adams raising his hand. Okay, Mr. Adams. Yeah, again, uh, good morning. Again, for the record, my name is Butler Adams. I just wanted to make a quick comment on the uh, item number one for 1614 to 1638 North Pulaski. So I saw this uh, presentation and project at the Committee on Design several months ago. And it's certainly an interesting and exciting project to have this bank that's been kind of derelict and mothballed for a number of years and writing away to be rehabbed and incorporated into this new project. Um, one of my disappointments that I'm looking at, though, for this particular project is I'm looking at the, the project narrative and the, the, the timeline and outreach. In some of the renderings, there's a terrace, rotate, extend, uh, which is a preferred alt alternative. It seems like the design chosen, the alternative, is the most bland and boring ones, just kind of straightforward. It has you know, no articulation or anything like that. Personally, I like the rotate design. It kind of breaks up the massing. You have uh, numerous levels of, uh, of, of, of green space on the building itself. And this seems more eye-catching. I think the whole project as a whole is certainly beneficial and bringing back this uh, this uh, this uh, old bank building as well as uh, filling up a vacant lot and adding affordable housing, but it's it's kind of disappointing that uh, the more vibrant and interesting design was not chosen. Um, in terms of the flow of the current proposal, in terms of the coloration, I think there's certainly some um, possibilities in terms of, uh, of visualizations of architecture for the for the for different colors on the facade itself, but I'm hoping those fins are colored on both sides because some of those renderings show the building as kind of this gray block that has no color to it. So I'm hoping that's just the rendering and not which which is going to be uh, in actuality. But otherwise, you know, it's a pretty good project. But I was just hoping that a uh, a more unique design for the addition had been chosen. Otherwise, a uh, good luck, and it's not to see this old vintage bank building 
I would say renovated. I wish it could be more restored in terms of the interior plaster, but you know, I'm glad it's not being torn down. But again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Are there any other speakers? Uh, Chair Roman, they, uh, if for phone callers, if they want to raise their hand in Zoom, they can press star nine. Okay, we'll give that a few seconds. Not seeing any more hands raised. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. Next item on the agenda are matters submitted in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Do I have a motion to approve items number one and two under the disposition heading, items number three, four, and five under the ANLPA, um, AP heading, sorry, item number six under the negotiated sale heading, and items number seven, eight, nine, and 10 under the acquisition heading? Commissioner oh. Wagensback moves. Motion okay, motion by Commissioner Wagensback. Do I have a second? Escarena. Commissioner Escareño, thank you. Roll call vote. Commissioner Barclay? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Biaggi? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett is here. Oh, perfect. Thank you, yes. Commissioner Burnett. Uh, Commissioner Escareño was a yes. Can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Uh, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a recusal from Commissioner Soto on this one. Uh, Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Wagensback, can you confirm? Yes. Thank yes. you. And, uh, Madam Chairwoman, Chair, just to go back, uh, we skipped Commissioner Cox and Commissioner oh. Murphy is now present. Sorry about that. Uh, Commissioner Cox, would you like to vote on this? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And for the record, Commissioner Murphy is present. Commissioner, would you like to vote on this? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me note that so I don't skip you guys again. Perfect. Motion passes. Now we will move on to the public hearing. Madam Chair, you missed Commissioner Novara as well. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm a yes. That's, okay, perfect. Thank you. Commissioner Novara. Got you. Uh, okay, motion still passes. Thank you. Uh, now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. We have a slight change to the agenda order today as voted on earlier item D1 is deferred. We will hear the remaining three items in the order in the following order. Uh, D4 will go first then uh, followed by D2 and then last uh, item D3. So the first item today is D4, a proposed resolution to adopt the Altenheim framework plan. The Eltonheim uh, framework plan sets the foundation for a recreational trail and string of open spaces on a two mile section of elevated rail line on Chicago's west side in the communities of North Lawndale, East Garfield Park and West Garfield Park. It is grounded in a year long effort to engage residents and stakeholders through in person and virtual meetings and an online survey. In addition to planning for the future trail and related open spaces, the plan identifies redevelopment opportunities in six unique focus areas surrounding the rail line and proposes concept plans. The plan also addresses potential impacts on the surrounding community with a section devoted to equitable investment that makes recommendations for resident retention, local and economic growth, and anti-displacement strategies. An informational presentation was provided to the Chicago Plan Commission, and the draft plan was made available for public comment in November 2022. Brian Hacker will provide the context overview and present the proposal plan. Thank you, Chairwoman Flores, and uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Brian Hacker. I'm a planner with the Chicago Department of Planning and Development. And I'm pulling up my presentation right now. So 
So yeah, uh, as mentioned, uh, I am here today to present uh, the Alton Heimline Framework Plan for Adoption uh, to Plan Commission. This is presented by the Department of Planning and Development as a city project and is in the uh, community areas of North Lawndale, East Garfield Park and West Garfield Park, uh, encompassing uh, the uh, 24th and 28th wards. So we're here today to uh, adopt a long range plan for an elevated trail on the city's west side. I'll be presenting the uh, overall goals, recommendations, and design concepts included in the plan uh, for your review and feedback. Uh, I'll also be covering some of the public feedback that we received uh, since I originally presented this plan back in November. We put it out for public comment and received uh, some comments from uh, members of the public. And then uh, the final action being to uh, adopt the plan. This slide shows the study area that, and, uh, that was included in the planning project. Uh, as you can see, the section of elevated rail line that was covered in this uh, spans roughly from Costner Avenue uh, to the west uh, to uh, California Avenue to the east. But looking at the hash line there, we cast a wider net to consider opportunities for redevelopment and look at the surrounding areas that would be impacted by a, a project such as this. And as mentioned, this is uh, it's predominantly in North Lawndale, but also touches East and West Garfield Park. Uh, one important thing to call out about this uh, is that this is a rails with trails opportunity. This uh, nice drone photo here <clears throat> shows the uh, Altenheim line uh, right of way as it currently exists uh, at Homan Avenue and the Homan Square campus, uh, which is the former Sears headquarters. Uh, so you can see here uh, in the center on the uh, elevated infrastructure there, there are two existing rail lines there and uh, in preliminary talks with CSX, uh, the freight company that owns those rail lines there, or the, the right of way, I should say, uh, they have expressed interest in maintaining uh, freight access along this line. So at this point, we're considering this as a uh, rails with trails uh, project. So to provide an overview of the plan scope, uh, this slide shows the overall plan for the uh, recreational trail and related open spaces that are uh, along the elevated portion of the elevated rail line that we considered for the study. Uh, so that's obviously one major focus of the, the plan, but uh, any major public investment like this uh, is an opportunity to take a look at redevelopment in the community. Uh, so we've identified six focus areas uh, that are opportunities for future growth and uh, new, either new development, rehab of existing properties, leveraging a city properties. And then finally, uh, which this was mentioned by uh, Mr. Adams in the, the comment uh, section, we want to look at uh, strategies for equitable investment and how this, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a large public infrastructure investment such as this could be a benefit to existing residents, future residents of these communities. Uh, how that investment can be leveraged for equitable growth and uh, make sure that uh, the current residents are able to remain in place uh, and not uh, be subject to displacement. Uh, apologies for the small text on this slide, but uh, I think this does a nice job of capturing the collaboration that took place. Uh, to bring this project to where it currently is today, uh, there was pretty broad coordination on the city side with obviously DPD, uh, but also CDOT, uh, the Department of Housing, uh, DCASE, which is the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, and uh, also working closely with both the 24th and uh, 28th uh, ward offices, Alderman, uh, Alderman Michael Scott, as well as Alderman Mo now Monique Scott, and then in the 28th ward, Alderman Jason Irvin. Uh, we engaged with a stakeholder advisory group, uh, several folks from the community, and uh, worked with a pretty large consultant team that was led by SOM, uh, but included a number of sub-consultants. Uh, the timeline of the project uh, runs from summer of 2021 to the present, uh, which hopefully this will be closing that process out. We engaged with the community at three points in the, the process. 
Uh, and these included both uh, in-person and uh, virtual meetings to try to be as accessible as possible. Uh, we held a number of stakeholder interviews with institutions, uh, businesses, uh, organizations that are active in the area. Uh, we had an online survey that uh, was uh, available for uh, four or six weeks or so and got a strong response. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, work closely with the local aldermen and other elected officials. And then uh, to make sure that the public had a sufficient amount of time to review the uh, final draft of the plan, we posted it on the DPD website uh, from mid-November until the end of December. Uh, we also sent out email notifications to distribution lists and worked with our partners in the area to make sure that uh, they got the word out about a uh, review of the draft plan. And it, we didn't get a large number of responses, but we did get, I think, some very uh, poignant feedback. And some of those are uh, comments are captured in these bubbles here. You know, for I won't hit all of them, but, you know, for example, someone recommended that uh, we include a statue of uh, activist Fred Hampton, who is uh, from the community area. Um, you know, putting QR codes on the signage uh, to be, you know, more technologically uh, up with the times uh, and to allow folks to access more information about the, you know, surrounding areas. Uh, somebody, you know, requesting that we are acknowledging the uh, prioritization of the youth in the area and their involvement in a project like this. And uh, also, somebody else, you know, really uh, put a priority on building more infrastructure dedicated to active transportation in the area to create better opportunities for those who don't drive. Next, I'm going to be getting into the section of the plan related, or sorry, the uh, background and uh, context information that's in the plan. Uh, I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly uh, to get to the, you know, uh, more meaty elements of it. Uh, but in our review of existing plans and existing conditions, uh, the North Lawndale Quality of Life Plan factored very heavily. This is something that there's broad community consensus around. And uh, you know, we feel that the uh, Altenheim Line Plan is uh, just a logical growth out of that because the Quality of Life Plan puts a priority on active transportation, uh, you know, wellness through uh, physical activity, multimodal uh, transportation, greening vacant properties, creating local jobs, and uh, expanding the retail amenities in the community, as well as uh, preserving affordable housing. And we can't talk about planning context without mentioning Invest Southwest. North Lawndale is a uh, Invest Southwest community. Ogden Avenue between uh, Pulaski, I'm sorry, between um, uh, Kedzie on one side and going out to Surmac and Pulaski on the west side is one of our priority corridors. And we have uh, three major Invest Southwest projects that are uh, underway in various stages right now. Uh, going from left to right, uh, Grace Manor is a mixed use uh, multifamily affordable housing pro project that is, uh, um, I think, going to be breaking ground soon on Ogden Avenue. Lawndale Redefined uh, is also on the Ogden Avenue Invest Southwest Corridor, and it's a, a project that DPD selected via RFP. And the Roosevelt Costner development is at the west end of the uh, study area for this plan. And it is a uh, local job generator with two large industrial buildings and a couple of uh, community buildings that will focus on uh, yeah, workforce capacity, and uh, other community uh, uh, events. To zoom in a little bit on the Roosevelt Costner project, this one is, uh, as I mentioned, particularly relevant because it's located at uh, what would be the western terminus of the uh, elevated trail. So you can see the site plan and the rendering here. Uh, there are two large industrial buildings that uh, will be tenanted. Uh, the tenants haven't been announced yet. But we're hoping to break ground on this project soon, be tenanted by uh, businesses that will uh, engage with the community for local hiring. Uh, it also includes a second phase of two community buildings that are going to be tenanted by uh, New Covenant, CDC, and uh, Black Men United for uh, community uh, activities and uh, um, amenities. And uh, as I mentioned, the elevated trail will go right through the uh, center of this project here, 
and we're um, maintaining land for a future connection to the trail at this site. We did an extensive market analysis with the help of our consultant team, and uh, I won't go into all the gritty details of this, but we looked at the uh, real estate market for you know all of the uh, land use typologies that we would be considering here. Uh, this is an area where there isn't such a strong market for new construction, just generally speaking. So the first priority would be for renovation and rehab of existing project or properties. There are a lot of uh, excellent, uh, you know, buildings within the study area with historic uh, um, value. And uh, at this point, new construction would mainly have to be subsidized by public funding for projects such as affordable housing. But it's not to say that there couldn't be a future uh, market for new construction. Uh, lastly, in this section, I want to touch on the uh, equitable uh, planning elements of the uh, of the project. As mentioned, we had a uh, major section of the plan devoted to uh, how we can retain uh, the current residents in this area and how we can avoid any potentially you know disparate impacts of a large public investment such as this. Uh, and the major pillars of this are to leverage city programs and policies to keep residents in place, to increase the stock of affordable housing. So uh, housing costs are not rising at a, a unreasonable rate in the area. We also want to leverage the uh, large amount of uh, parcels that the city owns in this area to make sure that you know, the city has some control over uh, the new development that's taking place and it's not entirely driven by the private market. Uh, we also want to uh, leverage city investments in this area to ensure that we are creating jobs, but not, uh, you know, just jobs in general, but jobs that could be going to re local residents, uh, you know, retail spaces that can be tenanted by small uh, local businesses to encourage entrepreneurship, to make sure that not only people are able to continue to live in the community, but also work in the community. Next, I'm going to move to the uh, trail and open space plan, another one of the major uh, elements of the plan scope here. So this is focusing on the actual elevated line itself, the opportunity to create an elevated trail and adjacent open spaces. This slide shows the plan of the existing conditions. Uh, to compare it to you know, the Bloomingdale Trail, the major projects such as this in the city, uh, this has varying widths to it. Uh, there are some sections that are quite a bit wider. You know, as you can see in these uh, bubbles at a location like Homan Avenue, it spans wider than 100 feet. So there are some sections where you're looking at a bridge, a continuous bridge deck that is quite wide, has a lot of opportunity. Uh, but then there are also some other sections uh, to the west where it is not so wide and you've got a sloping embankment going up to it. There are some intersections with uh, city streets where you're looking at a very narrow width. And when you're talking about the Rails with Trails project, that may present some challenges for uh, continuity of the plan. And that's addressed in more detail on how we can deal with that in the planning document, which is publicly available on the DPD's website. Uh, access is planned for eight different locations uh, along the uh, study section of the, the rail line. So there are not a lot of uh, streets that cross underneath the railroad here. It's mainly uh, major streets, which made this part of the uh, project fairly straightforward and easy to address. So uh, there are access points that are you know, roughly a half mile separated and it's pretty consistent. Uh, at these different access points, the existing conditions vary, uh, but mainly we're looking at conditions that are either a sloping embankment up to the uh, elevated trail, uh, which is addressed in uh, locations here. I'm not showing all of the access plans, but each access point has its own conceptual design plan. Uh, these examples at Pulaski and Independence show how at street level you could have, say, a hardscaped plaza space that is, you know, signaling the entrance uh, to the trail and allows for some gathering space. Uh, and also as the trail is, or, excuse me, the uh, ramp is going up to the trail, there are opportunities to integrate landscaping in there, of, uh, you know, various types of species and um, typologies. 
This slide shows uh, the different approach that would be taken at locations where there is a hard retaining wall that is uh, out to the edge of the railroad right of way. So this is uh, in areas such as Central Park, I should say intersections at such as Central Park and Homan. So uh, in these cases, we would have a switchback ramp that would lead up to the trail. And uh, examples of these plans are, are shown here. So in addition to looking at those access points, uh, the plan also focuses in on three uh, nodes on the uh, trail to provide some more de uh, detailed design concepts. So these are at uh, Independence, uh, Homan and Kedzie, and then to the east, uh, a location that's uh, adjacent to a UP rail line and it includes a city owned property. So going from west to east, uh, the first one is referred to as the Parkway Theater. This is at Independence Boulevard. Uh, this is really an area that makes sense to focus on because it's a connection to the city boulevard system. Uh, if you look at the plan to the lower left, uh, there is a concept to provide a, a stoop overhanging the uh, section of the um, boulevard that is uh, adjacent to the um, elevated rail line here. This is a great place to pause and uh, look out over the community. It provides uh, um, excellent views. And uh, this is a planned gathering space that is a, a kind of multi-use from just, you know, passive recreation to uh, program, cultural programming. The next uh, is at uh, Homan, the intersection with Homan at the Homan Square campus, which is the former Sears headquarters and has a lot of historic significance. So this is an area where there's already some uh, momentum on uh, using the trail. There is the Home and Rails farm that exists there. Uh, and there's an access point there where folks can already walk up there. So this is really leveraging the activity around the Home and Square campus that's already taking place. There is a, a DRW College Prep High School that's adjacent to this part of the trail. So this would create a, a, a lawn, a kind of a, a burn there where folks could sit. And uh, there's an opportunity to either project digital art or movies on the side of an adjacent building, and then to uh, also um, expand on that uh, garden that's there and have some community interaction here. So heading all the way to the east, uh, this is east of California, there is a uh, fairly large city owned property there that would uh, has a potential connection to the, the trail. So this is referred to as the campus green. There's an existing uh, hill that's there. So this just takes advantage of that, uh, you know, condition that's that's already there and creates an open space with views towards downtown, opportunities for passive recreation and gathering. And then this also uh, is a nice complement to the uh, Hope Academy slash uh, Lions uh, Club athletic facility that's located on the other side of uh, Taylor Street to the north, which is a uh, has community athletics and programs. So in uh, this section, as well as in the redevelopment uh, portion of the plan, there are detailed design guidelines that uh, as the project moves forward, these will provide, uh, you know, clear guidance on what the, the planning process yielded just in terms of uh, the design and aesthetic elements of trail access, the design of the actual trail, the adjacent open spaces uh, that could be built out in areas with wider right of way, uh, the types of species that should be included and uh, the, you know, existing foliage that could be retained. And then uh, as well as addressing, you know, kind of hardscape elements such as seating, lighting, signage, and fencing. So this is quite a detailed section in, in the plan, but I'm summarizing here for the sake of time. Next, I'll be covering the content of the focus area plans. So as I mentioned previously, we picked six focus areas uh, that are within the study area, and you can see them on this slide here. So uh, these were chosen based on uh, areas of existing activity, areas where there is a particular opportunity to uh, uh, either re renovate existing buildings that are underutilized or vacant or uh, utilize vacant property that's owned by the city. And I will cover each of them uh, 
as quickly as possible for the sake of time. So uh, I would say the kind of jewel of the uh, focus areas here is really the Homeland Square campus due to the real wealth of historic buildings that are, are here and some of the great things that are already happening in this location. Uh, the Home and Square Foundation has done an excellent work here to um, uh, rehab some of the existing uh, historic buildings here, like Nichols Tower, and uh, uh, build housing in an existing uh, uh, historic building. And uh, there are other buildings here, too, that ha are currently vacant and have a lot of opportunities. So uh, the plan just really contemplates keeping that momentum moving forward and uh, investing in some of the historic properties, but also uh, making uh, taking advantage of some of the uh, vacant properties or underutilized properties that, that currently exist. Yeah, uh, Alderman Burnett, I see you your hand raised. Yeah, I mean, you, it's a great presentation. You can go on and finish with the presentation, then I have a question. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, you can see, you know, the level of uh, plan that's done here, it's really with uh, massing and showing the types of land use uh, that are recommended and how they could connect with the uh, planned trail. So the... Uh, Next area is uh, Lawndale Plaza. This is an existing uh, commercial uh, strip retail, and uh, it's very automobile focused right now. So the plan makes recommendations that are related to, you know, uh, softening up some of that parking lot with a landscape, but then also reconfiguring it to put in some pedestrian scaled retail there that might also provide some smaller tenant spaces here instead of some of these larger spaces to be a little bit more accessible to entrepreneurs, smaller businesses. The North Lawndale Employment Network uh, currently has a facility that's at uh, Homan and Fillmore where they've got uh, you know, their offices, they've got a cafe there. So we're re really looking to build on some of the momentum of community oriented retail and amenities that they've started there and with this focus area. Uh, another is the Central Park Theater. So this is centered around Roosevelt and Central Park Avenue. If you're familiar with that area, there is a uh, gorgeous uh, historic theater there called the Central Park Theater uh, that uh, has opportunities for, you know, maybe more um, active use there. But this is an area where there's also a lot of vacant property, some of which is city owned land along Roosevelt Road, which is a very active corridor. And uh, we really see this as a chance to build a little bit higher density, uh, you know, mixed use, multifamily, residential, uh, also including some uh, you know, pedestrian you know, plaza space, maybe some kind of pop-up retail to really activate this section of the corridor where it can be a place where people can live, but also you know, go out to dinner. Uh, go out for entertainment and, uh, you know, just enjoy it uh, as, you know, uh, walking the corridor. As right now, it's very sparse. It's very automobile oriented. We'd like to remedy that. Um, and I, I apologize. I did only focus in on some of the, the more major uh, focus areas that are included in here for the sake of time. Uh, so I did not cover all six of them uh, to allow for more time for discussion and feedback. But uh, the same with the trail and open space plan. This also has an extensive design guidelines section where we're providing very um, uh, pointed design uh, guidance and feedback on, you know, what we're expecting out of a, uh, you know, projects that would be renovating existing uh, buildings projects that would be new construction for commercial or residential, and uh, in, as well as industrial. And then there are some uh, recommendations in this section for public infrastructure improvements, uh, improvements at each of these locations as well. So we can uh, make sure that we're making the public investments and in, uh, infrastructure to be supportive of new development. And uh, we're looking beyond the, the private parcels. Finally, uh, the plan does include a uh, section on implementation. So this is obviously related to follow-up actions uh, that will need to occur to bring all of the goals of the open space redevelopment and equity sections to fruition of the plan. It provides timelines and uh, prioritizes the implementation uh, action items 
It also assigns the relevant city departments that uh, are most likely to lead these different items. But it also looks at potential partners in the community and city at large who the city might be able to work with to, uh, you know, move this project along quicker and get better traction uh, because this is not, you know, just a top down uh, effort. It's, you know, very grounded in our interaction and our engagement with the, with the community and local elected officials. Uh, so some key next steps that need to take place to move this project ahead are um, we currently have funding to uh, complete a study of the, the real estate. So to uh, identify all of the uh, parcels, this is more technical than a project like this, identify the, the parcels of the railroad right of way, what are the opportunities for uh, potential purchase or long-term lease, and then what is the ownership of uh, some of these um, opportunity sites too. So we have uh, extensive collection of uh, property ownership data and uh, title information on the uh, relevant uh, uh, real estate here. And uh, as I previously mentioned, this land is currently privately owned. So further negotiation and coordination is needed with CSX. They have been engaged for this project so far. They are aware of this effort uh, and have been open to conversations. Uh, but the this is the first step in a much longer process. So uh, there's been no action at this time to negotiate or acquire that property. So finally, uh, just to rehash why we're here today, uh, this is again to present the uh, final draft version of the Alden Heimline framework plan and uh, the recommendations and guidelines that are related to recreational improvements, open space amenities. So to promote health and wellness on Chicago's west side, uh, also for the redevelopment, I'm sorry, uh, I can't read my screen here. <laughs> there we go. So also for the redevelopment of vacant land and the renovation of existing historic structures and six different focus areas that are within the planned study area. And last but not least, uh, to adopt the equitable planning strategies for the planned public investments with a priority given to resident retention, local economic growth and anti-displacement strategies. So that uh, concludes my presentation. And thank you. Take over. Thank you, Brian. I think uh, Commissioner Burnett has uh, a question and then followed by Commissioner Reyes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think this is fantastic. Um, very forward thinking. Uh, you know, uh, of course, we think about the Bloomingdale Trail and also the Highliner in, in New York. Uh, how both of those things have enhanced um, those areas that surround them. So I think this is going to be a great benefit for the West Side over here. Uh, two things. One, I know on both, I visited the, the Highliner and the Bloomingdale Trails, uh, both, and I always saw um, a, a conflict with bike riders and, and people who walk pedestrian uh, folks. Uh, how are you all putting something in place to um, balance that out? Or is it not going to allow any bike riding? Yeah, so that, that's an excellent comment. And uh, this is addressed uh, in the, the design guidelines. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is an area where you've got some pretty wide right of way uh, mm -hmm. along the section of the um, railroad line that's being studied. So in the guidelines, recommendations are made that where there is a more generous amount of space, that uh, there are opportunities to break off different uh, into different sections of the trail. Uh, so that's one opportunity for separating them or maybe like, you know, on the Bloomingdale Trail, there are sections where uh, there is, say, like a like a crushed gravel or like limestone walking path that is obviously not for, you know, bikers or whatever, uh, you know, like a scooter or something like that. So there's a chance to do that here. But then uh, there are also recommendations that are made. Uh, for when it's more narrow to ensure that uh, the trail is wide enough to accommodate all uses on it. Yeah, because even on the river walk, you know, um, you know, it became a conflict. And, um, you know, 
and, and even when you try to say no bikes allowed, folks still bring bikes, right? I know we've been talking about that over uh, with the uh, with the river, um, with the with we you know we're doing the improvements of the river over there. We're saying no bikes too, um, you know, along Chicago Avenue, Halstead. Uh, we're talking about that. I know with the casino part, they're going to allow bikes on that side, but on the other side, they saying something different. So we just need to think think about that because you know, um, uh, as we continue to get more millennials and Gen Zs and Gen Xs, whatever, you know, we tend to get more bikes, right? And they tend to become more and more vocal uh, and demanding, right, for uh, opportunities and space. So we just got to keep that in mind. Um, so this is a fantastic plan. Also, I want to know, uh, I know that, um, you know, part of the Bloomingdale Trail came from some TIF dollars. Is this, uh, is this area in the TIF area? And uh, are you looking for TIF money to go toward this? Or are you looking for some other uh, financing to go toward this? And maybe I know it's probably real early, but I just wanted to get an idea. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question, and yeah, thanks for the comments on uh, you know the uh, the bike issue uh, or access you know issue. And I would just want to mention to you that we would obviously coordinate. You know, CDOT was part of this this plan, and they would obviously be part of any process going forward. You know, uh, in a strong role. So that's something that I know they've got a lot of experience with. But uh, in terms of financing. The, the entire uh, section of the rail line is covered by various TIF districts. I, I, it's several, uh, but we're not at the point where we're identifying uh, exactly what type of funding we would use to advance the project. Yeah, so I know, uh, I don't know uh, how healthy these TIFs are, but I think it's worth uh, putting out some, if there's no money in it, to put out some bonds to, to front load it because I think you know if if things go the way they went with the Bloomingdale Trail, I think this area is going to enhance the TIF naturally uh, with the progression. So I think it's a, I think it's a I think you can bond this out and, and get money in those TIFs and be able to to make this stuff happen and uh, and be able to pay it off real quick uh, with you know. Just imagine if it's going to be like the Bloomingdale Trail and how prop property value went up so high. So just a uh, thought. Thanks. I, I love that optimism. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I see that Commissioner Novara is actually next and followed by Commissioner Reyes and then Commissioner Escareño. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Brian. Um, this is super exciting. And um, I also want to commend Alderwoman Scott, who it looks like is on here for getting this to this point. Um, and, and I did just want to add from a housing perspective, um, I know based on things that have happened with the Bloomingdale Trail, there's always questions and concerns about um, impact to surrounding property values and so on. And, and the, the difference I want to point out here is um, that we do have a lot of strong community-based organizations and a history of investment in affordable housing in the area surrounding this, specifically um, Foundation for Home and Square just to the north is has a long history of, of investment there and is and is you know looking at, at some very current ones. We've we as a city have been investing on Ogden Avenue to the south through Invest Southwest and um, and then in affordable home ownership with Lawndale Christian Development Corporation and um, United Power. So I did just want to convey that um, there is that kind of infrastructure around investments in people and being able to live affordably around this amenity um, uh, as it, it didn't come up as such. And then I guess my, my one question for you, Brian, kind of gets to what uh, Alderman Burnett was asking. I know that these kinds of projects are um, often many years in the making. Um, how far off are we talking here? That's that's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank, thanks for the uh, the comments and uh, providing some more uh, context around uh, housing in the area. I you know couldn't agree more, and I'm so appreciative to you. 
as well as your staff, uh, Aaron Johnson was really helpful to informing this plan and, uh, you know, giving it that uh, equity and, uh, you know, uh, affordable housing, a strong affordable housing element to it. So I think that's really one of the key components of it. Uh, like I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the next step is to really get a handle on the, uh, the property ownership here and to uh, consider what the city's action would be to, uh, you know, establish some, you know, for lack of a better term, control uh, or access to that. Uh, and I think that that figuring out that step will help us uh, determine what the path forward looks like. But uh, we also need to identify funding to pursue a uh, phase one study and so that is should come on right on the heels of uh figuring out the some of the real estate questions but that real estate portion of it is, is kind of a, a big if uh you know in other similar projects like this you know, you're know, you always dealing with uh you know like large typically like a large freight railroad and uh you know they that's an extensive process Thank you, Brian. Um, Commissioner Reyes? Yeah, I think this is an amazing plan. I mean, that's what it is clearly, right? So um, I do I do see that, you know, as the next steps of this plan, I am assuming besides the points that Brian just mentioned, uh, the financing is gonna be a critical one um, because it's an amazing plan. And the idea here, I guess, is to bring more residents, more economic development to these disinvested areas in some areas of it, because others are not. So I was a little surprised uh, by the fact that we did not hear from some community residents, because I would have been all over the place if this was something that it was going to happen at Pilsen, El Paseo, for example, because I think this is an amazing tool and it's an asset for this community. Uh, that clearly has been has been for many years this investment and uh, liabilities, but this truly could become a beautiful asset that can be the engine of economic development. Um, and we do have a key component that is already in place, which is the preservation and creation of more affordable housing, as Commissioner Navarra mentioned it recently. So I think that's a critical first first step. So. I would love to hear more comments from community residents that are aware of this plan and that they, they support the plan. But overall, it's, it's an amazing tool. I, um, I'm gonna to continue to wait for the time that it comes for the Pilsen you know, uh, community to be, because this is a great, great uh, plan. Thanks, Commissioner. Noted. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes, thank you. These are all really um, fantastic uh, comments. And um, again, this has really been uh, a labor of love, um, uh, really promoted first by uh, Alderman Scott uh, and now continued um, by Alderman uh, Monique Scott. So I just um, very obviously anxious to hear from uh, the Alderman um, on this because it's gonna take that continued advocacy uh, to push this uh, further along. Um, I think that there, uh, the comments about that, uh, and Brian, you might go to the project area that outlined the uh, potential impact area that is really um, existing housing, uh, existing neighborhoods, existing streets, uh, a high number of uh, parcels owned uh, by the city. So unlike uh, Bloomingdale's Trail, we actually have an opportunity here to control what happens for um, in the housing space. And uh, um, this isn't the one, I'm talking about the one that has a big boundary that shows a catch area, uh, impact area for the overall project. Yeah. Um, yes, this one. So uh, I actually think that um, what we really should be doing is trying to understand, um, is this the area that we need to protect uh, and have an overlay much like we did after the fact with Bloomingdale's Trail 
is it possible to identify an impact area where people are more likely to feel the change of value as the uh, multi-million dollar investment is made in the line. So, so I would wonder if we could get out ahead uh, and uh, plan for success, plan that we're gonna be successful and property values will go up as a result of having this amenity there and already have our affordable housing strategy in place. And as Commissioner Navarro said, there are a numerous number of affordable housing entities that are operating in this geography. And so there's no need. Um, I think everyone was critical of uh, when, the, when the Bloomingdale's Trail got adopted that nobody, I don't know, no one thought it was gonna be successful. <laughs> so they didn't plan for displacement. We, uh, this is a very, very different market. We have a, a lot more land here. So we can plan for zero displacement. And so I really uh, would encourage as a next step for us to sit down with our uh, zoning um, administrator and, uh, and housing and do what, uh, what was done for the Wilmingdale's Trail uh, for the Aldenheim line, even though I think we are probably some years away, but I think in terms of people's reception to this and embracing of this, if they know we're thinking about this issue of a zero displacement, I think they will be more inclined to become its champion. So that's uh, a point that I think really needs to be made. Um, I would also say uh, this coexistence with trails, uh, I, 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 over I oversaw uh, a trails, uh, a trails with rails project in Detroit, uh, the Southwest Greenway, which is under construction now. So uh, we can, you can coexist with uh, rails, and this is not a super active rail line, uh, but that means that we have to have um, a real understanding with the railroad about what right of way is being preserved, what right of way will be turned over for public use. And I think that's the next step. And ultimately, whether they gift it to us or it has to be purchased, uh, that's really the next step. And you know, got, you know, who knows how long uh, that will take because the land has to be surveyed. We have to actually have parcels uh, and there's a whole transfer of ownership that has to happen. So that's uh, a critical next step. You couldn't do that until you identify where you want it to have this uh, trails uh, with rails parcel. So that's an important next step. The housing overlay, the, the, the parcel understanding of what we're gonna try to, to uh, reserve for this pedestrian way, that's another important step. And then uh, I, I think a better or fairer comparison um, for this type of trail is the Woodlawn um, or the Inglewood, uh, trail that is currently uh, being um, uh, going through its community process. Uh, in that case, we use this type of framework to apply for a federal grant in partnership with CDOT. And we got the 20 million necessary to jumpstart the Inglewood Trail. So I, have, I think that this material will be helpful for us to build a case. And again, uh, Commissioner Biaggi is here and she can speak to this about, you know, what we need to have to make our case to get those federal dollars. And then the Lightfoot administration mirrored that investment, that federal investment and put infrastructure bond dollars for Inglewood. So in a matter of 12 months, Inglewood, Inglewood went from, uh, you know, a diagram and a lot of community activism and support to a project that is uh, virtually fully funded in 12 months. And so I do think that, you know, again, that speaks well to the promise of this uh, line, even though it's shared with the rail, it's not like uh, explicitly like Bloomingdale or uh, Inglewood. And I would personally rather uh, start to make references to Inglewood as opposed to Bloomingdale because the, the the markets couldn't be more different, right? I, and you know, I think uh, Inglewood shares, like with uh, North Lawndale, a lot of population loss, a lot of vacancy. Uh, so we have a we have a chance to repopulate these areas. That was not the case 
with, um, with uh, the Bloomingdale's Trail, where they started tearing down houses to make space for people who wanted to live near the trail. So very different comparisons. I like the Inglewood comparison better. I would also say that, you know, this is running primarily through a, a manufacturing and industrial area. So this has a great chance to be a job center, uh, a center of employment, uh, and, and coexist with a, an aggressive housing rehab and infill strategy. So uh, uh, really, really exciting work. It's wonderful to see us get out so far ahead. Uh, I would agree with, um, with Commissioner Reyes that, you know, I think it would be helpful if, um, if, if we try to understand how we create a, uh, okay, friends of the Alden Hound line uh, so that we actually are not leading this, uh, community members are leading it. So that may be a next step as well to, to invest in those community groups that really uh, value this and build up their capacity to be advocates for it. Um, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Uh, Commissioner Escareño, followed by Commissioner Brumfield. Uh, thank you. I actually, my question had been answered earlier regarding the, the timing and some of the, the, the funding. I guess just a, a quick question around some of the comments that uh, Commissioner Cox just made. I, I think it's a great comparison to the uh, Inglewood Trail and it's very, very exciting, I think, for uh, us here at the parks to see the growth of green space um, and just wondering if there's also opportunities. Um, there, the, all these natural connections to the, uh, the parks and the uh, boulevard uh, trails just really, um, you know, ex gives us a great opportunity to talk about how the city is also very focused on this open space, healthy living and expanding on um, the opportunities in areas that are underserved is just great. So just wondering if there's any thoughts or, or potentially an opportunity to look at also the sustainability angle from a, from a funding source, um, you know, because I do think that we continue to expand these green spaces. And I think being a, a city, this is unique to a major city like Chicago. To, to see this growth of green space and, and appreciating that and bringing that to community, specifically those uh, that are underserved. And then at the same time, growing the, the, the vi vibrancy through economic uh, opportunities here. So just wanted to add that as a potential opportunity. I know bonds were mentioned, uh, TIF was mentioned, but I think that maybe there's a different also opportunity with the sustainability angle. So totally love this. Thank you, and, and we at the parks are obviously committed to working with all of our, our stakeholders here to, to, to uh, support it in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scareño. Commissioner Brunfield? I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner uh, Escarino and also Commissioner Cox uh, uh, spoke to this as well, but I, I did want to just stress and emphasize that um, this uh, line uh, is very unique. And I think uh, Commissioner Cox mentioned this as well. The better comparison certainly is to uh, what is happening uh, at, in uh, Inglewood and the Ingle, future of the Inglewood line as well. I think we can't look at these efforts as something um, in comparison to the High Line uh, in New York, much different condition, much different market forces. Uh, also the Belt Line uh, in uh, Atlanta, again, much different scale much different economic forces. These two uh, efforts that we're undertaking uh, with the city uh, in partnership with the state as well are, I think, going to be national trendsetters here of how we could actually reposition uh, these distressed uh, infrastructure pieces and turn them into a different kind of asset that is really more about creating a new economy in our, our uh, distressed and challenged black and brown neighborhoods. So I see these as trendsetters. You know, and I think that uh, eventually, sooner rather than later, uh, the rest of the country and slick cities are going to be looking to Chicago and these neighborhoods specifically of how we actually address this. So just doubling down on that, these are really unique and trend-setting cases uh, that really can't compare to uh, national models out there because there are none. So um, just really commending the city uh, for focusing on this as well as the consultant team that they actually worked with and excited to see this move uh, in parallel uh, with, with Inglewood and hopefully catch up in funding, so. Very exciting plans. 
Um, I'm not seeing any more commissioners' hands uh, go up, uh, but I do know that Alderman Scott and Alderman Burnett would like to make a comment on this item. Whoever wants to take the floor first. Well, I think I made my comments. Thank you. I think Alderman Scott may have left, though. Okay. Yeah, it looks like she's fallen off, Joe. Okay. Um, do we have any of her staff uh, that, you know, present? And if they would like to make a comment or uh, we'll just go on? Okay. Um, it says that some participants uh, have raised their hand. So, Commissioner Lyons, I see your hand. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for this presentation. Um, I echo uh, a lot of what everyone has said about um, this is really an exciting vision. Um, I had a question, I think, about the, I really appreciate the, um, the intentionality around equitable investment and job growth um, and having a proactive approach to resisting or um, preventing any resident displacement. I was curious about in terms of the workforce or job training um, or the quality of jobs, um, if that's something that we're thinking about um, as a part of um, equitable investment. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, uh, Commissioner. And thank you, I wanna thank everybody else for the uh, excellent comments uh, as well uh, prior to this. Uh, it's definitely uh, all very relevant and uh, you know, I think is gonna really inform our perspective going forward on this. So um, yeah, thanks again. Uh, so under the uh, equitable uh, you know, investment and uh, development portion of the plan, uh, so, Obviously, there's a significant amount that's related to, to housing and uh, resident retention, uh, you know, leveraging city owned properties. But another one of the um, major uh, priorities is local job creation and, uh, you know, encouraging entrepreneurship and things like that. But I, I feel like really the meat of that is in the efforts that are taking place under Invest Southwest right now. As I mentioned, uh, and I can go to this slide, the um, Roosevelt Costner project, which the city has several millions million of dollars worth of, of TIF funding into, uh, as well as, uh, you know, donating the, uh, or writing down the land cost because it's a city owned uh, property here. So this is a great example of the work that's already being done. This is a project that's, you know, about to break ground within weeks uh that is going to leverage city land and city resources to bring several hundred jobs to the community and it, you know I, i'm not sure if you know you follow the rfp process on this at all but if you look at that document you know it is loud and clear in the, the language there that the project that is going to get built here will prioritize job creation for people living on the west side and not just say transporting some you know businesses in the suburbs and all their existing employees out there there has to be a local hiring plan not just for the construction i mean that there's a lot of policies that are in place for that but also for the the permanent jobs that are going to exist on this site you know going forward you know for decades here uh and so that I think is really just uh, a signal of like what's what's to come here uh, on the uh, one of the redevelopment areas is on the opposite end of the line uh, to the east near a um, near the Union Pacific uh, rail line that it runs into. So uh, I didn't show the redevelopment plan, but if you look at the campus green focus area to the east side here, this is a really nice complement to the Roosevelt Costner site on the west side because. This is an area that, as Commissioner Cox mentioned, it's it's staunchly industrial. It's not a, a, a site that we would uh, consider for like residential. So there's a large uh, industrial property there that's predominantly vacant. And it's in an area where there's a lot of exciting things brewing with the presence of Cinespace and with the presence of uh, Sinai and the redevelopment that they're doing there. So there's already, uh, you know, good partners in place there that and uh, existing development that could be leveraged. 
uh, but an opportunity to do something similar on that uh, mostly vacant parcel that's that's over there where we can work with a friendly uh, you know developer and partners to bring a project that is gonna not just you know be an employer but also have you know maybe a community uh, aspect to it too like the Roosevelt Costner site does where maybe there's a chance for a, a local organization like you know some like a home and square foundation or you know I, I just throw that out as an example but for them to have a portion there that focuses on um, job training on you know entrepreneurship business incubator uh, it's a great opportunity to get creative and uh, you know complete another community oriented development there Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands. So one more, Commissioner no, Cox. I just wanted to uh, to add on that. I mean, I thought your citing of the Roosevelt Costner as the first uh, first real investment in this uh, was a, a case in point that this is mostly going to be about employment center uh, and less about housing along the trail. I think the housing opportunities are on the existing streets a little further north or south of the line. But your, your comment definitely um, raised uh, 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 an opportunity here that I, we probably should um, uh, build on. And that is the uh, North Lawndale Employment Network that is super focused obviously on uh, uh, workforce training and putting uh, residents that have been difficult to, to um, find employment into the picture, they are basically on the line. So I would maybe think, uh, Brian, that it would be appropriate for us to make a presentation to um, the uh, North Lawndale Employment Network's leadership team to let them know about you know, this kind of nexus between the trail and, and jobs. So. Yeah, and they may the expansion of their campus may be one of the things that uh, come out of this because I know that there is some vacancy in the buildings that have been highlighted here. Uh, the number five is a uh, is a, a a vacant movie theater uh, that could very well be a part of the North Lawndale's employment uh, campus. So, uh, I, but I just don't know if we've made a presentation to them, even though kind of it is in their backyard. So we did do a stakeholder interview with them, and they're, you know, one of our strongest uh, partners out in that area when it comes to, you know, workforce and uh, employment, uh, you know, uh, capacity. So, uh, yeah, I know that Brenda Palms Barber, who's the CEO there, is, is aware of the project, but uh, they're certainly on our list of future partners here. You know, we've talked to so many folks out in the community, like, you know, the UCAN Academy, uh, Hope Academy, and people are really excited about this project. I, I guess I could have done a better job of communicating that in my presentation, but the um, engagement that was done here was was very deep in the support that we got from not just residents in the meetings, but also from, you know, institutional and organizational stakeholders here was, was very strong. And, uh, you know, people are like, they they would love to like jump at an opportunity like this and uh, you know potentially partner with the the city in in one way or another for a project like this. Commissioner Lyons, do you have a follow up comment? Yeah, um, no, thank you for for that. That's very helpful um, to know. And I would just add, you know, I think as we're looking at um, other, you know, thinking about the jobs. Um, thinking about how we're evaluating the quality of jobs and encouraging really good jobs that are gonna come out of out of this for local residents. Um, and I, I love thinking about partnering with organizations, workforce development organizations. And I would also encourage um, organizations like um, that are uh, you know, creating pre-apprenticeship apprenticeship programs um, or you know, pathways to registered apprenticeships um, as well. I think the opportunity here is, is super exciting. Um, to create those pipelines to really, really good jobs for, for the community. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. If there are no further uh, questions or comments, uh, we'll go on to uh, take a motion on this item. Do I have a motion on a proposed resolution to adopt the Altenheim framework plan, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? 
Motion to pass the Altenheim plan, Commissioner Wagenspeck. Thank you, Commissioner Wagenspeck. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Go ahead. It was, was, I know I heard uh, Commissioner Burnett on that one. That's fine. Okay. Um, we'll go on to uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Biaggi? Stepped out. Uh, Commissioner Brunfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner um, Lyons? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Navarra? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Soto? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Thank you. And finally, Commissioner uh, Wagensback. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Exciting plans, Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, I just uh, wanted to um, take a moment and just thank uh, Brian Hacker for his leadership in uh, shepherding this project. It's uh, as uh, Commissioner Brumfield said, it's, it's unprecedented, uh, the take we've had. And uh, I think he's just done a wonderful job in bringing this to uh, a vote. And uh, he can put this in his uh, list <laughs> of uh, transformational things uh, that he's led for the city of Chicago. So uh, thank you, Brian. Thanks so much, Commissioner. I, I just also want to mention really quick, I got a, a text from Tani Williams, who's uh, Alderman Scott's chief of staff. And she just mentioned that uh, she was in the airport and uh, had to get on a uh, flight. So she, that's why she had to, to drop off. So poor timing, but uh, just yeah. <laughs> she's a big, big supporter of yeah. uh, as, as was uh, Alderman uh, Michael Scott. So uh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying great, that. Great work, Brian. Thanks so much. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item. Uh, for the next item, I'm a, I must recuse myself as my firm is working on this proposal. Uh, Vice Chairman Brumfield will take the gavel in my place. Vice Chairman Brumfield, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Chairwoman Flores. Next item on the agenda is D2, a proposed residential build, business plan development submitted by Team Pioneros. LLC for the property journey located at 1614 to 1638 North Glasgow Road. The applicant proposes to rezone the site from B3-2 Community Shopping District to B3-3 Community Shopping District and then to a residential business plan development. The proposed plan development would support the construction of a nine-story, 112-foot mixed-use residential building, an apartment building containing 85 dwelling units, 58 parking spaces, a health clinic, as well as the Chicago Public Library. The overall FAR for the development should not exceed 3.9. This is item 21082 in a 26 ward. Mike Perella will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Mike. Hello, uh, everyone hear me okay and see the presentation? Yes. Great. Good morning. For the record, my name is Michael Perella, a project manager with the Department of Planning and Development. With me today are members from the applicant team. The developer, Team Pioneers LLC, represented by Matt Mosier of Park Road Development. The attorney, uh, Terry Diamond of Neil and Leroy. And the architects, uh, Juan Moreno, Emilio Padilla, and Ryan Chester of JGMA. The proposed development is located at uh, 1614 to 1638 North Pulaski Road in the Humboldt Park community area. The applicant team is uh, Team Pioneers LLC, an entity specifically created to develop this project and it consists of um, Park Road Development and JGMA. The applicant is appearing here today for the purposes of changing the underlying zoning from B32 Community Shopping District to B33 Community Shopping District prior to establishing residential business plan development. The proposed project is a mandatory uh, PD per section uh, 178.0513A of the zoning ordinance because it 
uh, proposes a total unit count above the threshold set by the underlying zoning. Okay, moving on. Um, the subject site is situated in the Humboldt Park community area, 26 Ward, Alderman Maldonado. Uh, the Humboldt Park community area is a diverse and growing community with a sizable uh, majority of Latino residents. Uh, like many neighborhoods on the northwest side of Chicago, the neighborhood is facing increasing pressure of gentrification, high housing prices, and the lack of affordable housing drive long time families away. Uh, the PD originated directly from the city's Invest Southwest RFP initiative. In April of 2021, the Department of um, Planning and Development released the Pioneer Bank RFP, seeking qualified developers to redevelop the vacant, landmarked former Pioneer Bank building, as well as the vacant parcels directly to the north. The bank building is part of the North Avenue Invest Southwest corridor, one of the city's uh, established Invest Southwest corridors uh, uh, across the city. Uh, the Department of Planning and Development established goals and objectives for the RFP, which were to ensure that the chosen submission was compatible with the city's objectives, which were uh, community inclusion, representation, uh, community wealth building, affordable housing, design excellence, uh, preservation of the bank building itself, walkability, and equitable transit-oriented development. The applicant was one of two who submitted bids to redevelop the site, and uh, DPD's evaluation included community meetings and a full review of the financial design and zoning components of the project. And there, uh, we had chose uh, Team Pioneers LLC in October 21, because they best represented the goals of the RFP itself. Uh, the site uh, of the PD is at the northwest corner of Pulaski Road and North Avenue. is currently privately owned. The applicant and the owner are, are currently closing on the purchase, purchase of the site, and the current owner provided consent to file the PD. The site is just north of the aforementioned Pioneer Bank building, but, but as, a, as a note, that site is not included within the PD boundary. The PD site is just over an acre in size, or uh, 45,841 square feet. It includes a portion of the alley directly north of North Avenue and west of Plasky Road. This alley will be vacated to make way for the project. Uh, the project is currently served by the number 72 North Avenue bus and the 53 Pulaski Road bus. It's about two and a half miles uh, west of the Damon Blue Line station of the, and um, it's considered transit served and which allows for a reduction in the applicable parking standards an MLA reduction and an FAR increase and height increase. Um, uh, of, of which the applicant will be taking advantage of to complete the project. Uh, it's currently zoned B32, as I mentioned. Adjacent zoning consists of uh, B32 to the north uh, and B15 zoning uh, for the Pioneer Bank building to the south and points west along North Avenue and B12 zoning along North Avenue to points east. And to the west, the residential areas are zoned to RT4. It sits just north of the uh, North Avenue commercial corridor which is the primary retail and transportation corridor to the northwest side, uh, running from the lakefront along Illinois Route 64 all the way out to the west suburbs and beyond. Um, the corridor itself is a mix of two and three story mixed use commercial buildings, some small apartment buildings and drive up retail. Um, it's uh, fairly um, productive. There's a limited vacancy in the corridor and sees a high amount of traffic. Uh, to the west, uh, the residential blocks consist of a mix of four story courtyard apartment buildings, as well as two and three story multifamily apartments, duplexes and single family homes. Um, so just to wrap up the introduction here before I turn it over to the development team, you know, what we're approving here today will, will hopefully be a, uh, a residential business plan development and in order to construct a nine story under nine foot three inch mixed use apartment building featuring 85 units of which 100% will be affordable to those earning less than 60% in some cases less than 30% AMI, uh, a minimum of 58 automobile, automobile parking spaces and uh, 43 bike parking spaces. A branch location of the Chicago Public Library a, uh, will also be included in the project, as well as a Humboldt Park Health Counseling Service Center, a community room, public plaza, and an exterior marketplace. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to the developer team, which, which will take you through the specifics of the proposal, and I'll be uh, available to answer questions and wrap up at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can you hear me? All right, this is Terry Diamond. I'm the attorney with Neil and Leroy on behalf of Team Pioneros, the applicant for the development for the subject property at 1614 to 1638 North Pulaski Road. Team Pioneros is a collaboration of JGMA Architects and Park Road Development with other firms. It is 100% Latino owned. The site is located on Pulaski Road immediately north of the Pioneer Bank building. 
The site is 34,518 square feet. It is currently a surface parking lot and an alley zone B3-2. As Mike said, this is an equitable transit oriented development because it's located on two bus lines, the 53 Pulaski and the North Avenue 72. The property is part of the city Southwest initiative together with the Pioneer Bank building, which is not part of the plan development. Its intent is to bring vibrancy to the intersection of Pulaski and North Avenue. The bank building is going to be restored as a center for Latino commerce, a cultural hub, workspace that will also house the offices of JGMA Architects and the Latino Architect Organization Architectos. It will also include a business technology education center. The building that will be constructed to the north on the subject site will include 85 units of affordable housing. It will include an outdoor marketplace, a new Chicago Public Library, a Humble Park Health Center, shared community space, and 58 parking spaces. We have two speakers today. Matt Mosier from Team Pioneros will be the next speaker. He will provide a summary of the community engagement process, the mix of affordable units. And Juan Moreno from JGMA Architects will be the second speaker. He will discuss the design concept, its evolution, elevations, building features, amenities, and sustainability components. So Matt, you're next. Thanks, Terry. Uh, and thanks, Mike. And good morning, commissioners. Thanks for, for having us today. So I'm Matt Moser from Park Road Development, representing Team Pioneros LLC. Um, just to go quickly through the timeline, we started the PD process uh, on July 20th of 2022. Uh, concurrently with that, uh, we have had numerous community meetings. All of them have been held at Clemente High School. We found that that was the most convenient location for everybody to kind of get to and also house as many people as we could. Uh, started in February of 2022, you can see on the, the slide on the screen, um, the last meeting we had was in December 2022. We're going to restart those meetings in February, and as we've started to, to develop the design more, we'll increase the frequency of those meetings. Go to the next slide. Uh, as Terry and Mike noted, we will exceed the ARO requirements that the city has, that all 85 units will be affordable. The makeup of those units, it's a mix of one, two, three, and four bedroom units with the majority being over one bedroom. Ha and happy to turn it over to Juan Moreno to go through the design parts process. Thank you, Matt. Um, and esteemed commissioners, uh, chairman, I just, uh, I have to say and share my gratitude for for the administration, the Lightfoot administration, Commissioner Cox, DPD, Commissioner Navarro, you and all your staff. Um, what, what I'm gonna share with you is a beautiful story of what the Invest Southwest program has meant to our firm, our entire team and elevated minorities in such a beautiful way that um, has really inspired us in our thought process for the project. So as we began this journey, we knew there was a landmark bank um, and the PD today really focuses on the housing and library, but the bank was always the core of inspiration and we could never forget about it. The next slide. So as we started thinking about the programming, uh, and again, I know the bank is not part of this PD, but it's important for, for everyone to know that it was really a, a moment, kind of an epiphany for, for our firm to realize that um, as part of the Invest Southwest movement, we really needed to be as an office in the communities that we're serving. We've, we've enjoyed our time in downtown, but it's, it's really in the community where our heart needed to be to help in uplifting. So we made the conscious decision to, uh, we will close our offices in downtown and move to Humboldt Park. That also inspired our thought process about the rest of the building, frankly. Next slide. And the idea of how do you continue history? How do you look to the past, but really think forward in a way that you can create a continuum and a legacy that always celebrates what's always been there, right? And we're, we're quickly gonna come upon 
uh, the 100 year anniversary of the Pioneer Bank building and how we can always remember that, but at the same time, look forward to a, a bright future. Next slide. And in you know these enlightened community engagement sessions, you know it's it's been fascinating to hear the community come out, share their personal stories of what the bank has meant to them, but also, you know, we know Humble Park is an unbelievable legacy for the Puerto Rican community. But we've learned as these community groups have come out, it's also a really beautiful Colombian community, Venezuelan, Mexican, Costa Rican so many that this really started to influence our thoughts on the housing, how we can influence all those cultures into the exterior of the building. Next slide. So this is an image of what was submitted for the competition. The next image shares with you where we are today and how design, you can go to the next slide. Um, how the design has evolved and really, I think, matured in such a beautiful way that really takes into consideration the needs of residents today. It's a design that we're incredibly proud of. And as you can see, just kind of the aspects of Latino culture, how they filter their way into the exterior of the building. And the bank always sits there in its prominence. Next slide. Here you can see the composition and it really leads to that discussion of the continuum of history from the bank building as you see on the left side of your image to the housing and library as it moves northward. That there's a beautiful story between the two of past and present and future and it, it's meant a lot to us and our team. Next slide. And that in between the two from the bank to the library and housing, there's a marketplace that really starts inside this cultural hub in the bank, but extends itself to the outside. It's a gathering space that's next to a community space within the library that allows the residents and the neighborhood groups to utilize these spaces at, at all hours. Next slide. And also to really think about architecture with recognizing that all facades matter, that there is no real back to the building, that it's respecting all sides. It's North Avenue presence, it's Pulaski presence, or even an alley presence because there are residents to the West and it's a design that's been highly sensitive to thinking about the people in the community and its context. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Emilio Padilla, to just quickly walk through the plans with you. Emilio. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emilio Padilla. I'm an architect at JGMA. And what we're, um, what we're going to run through a series of the plans, the elevations, and, and the sections, just to walk you through the program, the stacking, and our thought process, how this building came together. Uh, the um, the site, as was mentioned, is immediately north of the landmark Pioneer Building. It's uh, it's about thirty four thousand square feet of of area. Um, there is um, there is a uh, a shared outdoor marketplace in between the two buildings that, that serve as a as an open space for uh, for for gathering and also you know as many of you who are familiar with the neighborhood know. There's a number of, of street vendors all around this, this community. And, and the thought there was to create a space for them to, to congregate. And then, uh, you know, the way we're treating the, the, the streetscape design along Pulaski with very tight sidewalks, we've pushed the building back to allow for a, a better procession into the building. And then to the West, we have um, a surface parking that will, uh, that will be for the library staff and employees and also the loading area and the entrance to the parking garage uh, from, that, from that side of the building. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, our, our thought here uh, with, with the, oh, it's, it's skipped to, it's fine. We could, we could jump into the, the ground floor. Um, one more, Mike, uh, level one. Perfect. On, on the first, floor will have a branch of the Chicago Public Library occupying the majority of the floor plate. Um, they will also uh, be operating a community room um, to the left here on screen that will be have a direct connection to the outdoor marketplace. 
Um, so that, that will serve as a, as a shared common space for not only the residents in the community to use, uh, but for the library functions as well. And then we have the main entrance off of Pulaski Road, the shared vestibule that brings residents into the building. And then we have ground level uh, bike, bike uh, parking off of the, uh, the, the west side of the building. Next slide. The library will have two floors. So there would be a, a second floor at the library. Uh, we'll also have an, it will, it will have a double height space that's connected with a uh, large sculptural learning stair that will lead up to a double height space. Next slide. On the third floor, we'll have a um, um, parking garage that will serve 58 uh, parking spots. And this will be an open parking garage. On the fourth floor, we have a, an, a tenant amenity level that will have uh, outdoor terrace space for the residents of the community. Um, we have a number of, of, of tenant uh, amenities from ranging from fitness rooms, community rooms, game rooms, uh, a, a kitchen, and also the location for the health counseling center and a, and a green roof area uh, on this level. Next slide. The uh, levels five through nine will have all the residential units. Like was mentioned, there's a total of 85 units. Um, and then the mix is between one bedrooms and four bedrooms. But even at the lowest uh, floor of the residential units, which is level five, um, it's about 50 feet above ground level. So the views that all the residents will have from every one of these units will, will, will be um, just magnificent. You'll have city views, you'll be able to see Humble Park, the skyline. Um, and that was part of the thought process of raising uh, the units up to a level where, where views uh, would be accessible to all. Next slide. And then at the, at the top of at the roof, uh, we'll have a series of photovoltaic solar panels and, and a green roof. Next slide. Um, as we, um, you know, we're showing here the relationship of the proposed building and, and, the, uh, and the existing landmark bank. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the nine story building uh, is, is set back just slightly from, uh, from the landmark bank. And then, and then there's a, a number of horizontal and vertical expressions that are uh, taken from the language of the bank. And that was, that was part of our thought process and how we designed the facade here. Next slide. In the lower left, you can see what that, out, that covered outdoor marketplace starts to look like. Um, and it allows you know, just that, that space for congregation. Also, it creates a second entrance for the bank. There's a, a covered masonry opening that we, we discovered that existed on the north elevation of the bank that will now be uh, made, ex made accessible. So it would serve as a second entrance. And so that, that'll be the, the, the linking area between the two buildings. Next slide. Uh, this is the elevation facing uh, the alley side. As you can see here, there's where the speed ramp uh, will come up and we've you know, treated the facade in the way where you see that, that ramp uh, coming up. And then the, um, the separation between uh, the, the lower public functions and then the upper level um, residential program. This is the uh, elevation facing north. And you can see here is the massing of the building. The higher you go up, there's a setback from the property line. It's approximately about 50 feet. Um, so that pushes the higher portion of the building back. And as Mike has mentioned, there's a number of uh, smaller density residential uh, buildings to the west, uh, but there's a almost, almost 75 foot setback uh, to those buildings. Next. Here you can see that uh, operable wall connection uh, from the, the community room out into the outdoor marketplace on the lower uh, right, on the lower bottom of this image. And then the, uh, the, the outdoor terrace area that it, right in between the parking garage and the, uh, and the residential floors. Next slide. And just the, uh, the sections you're showing the, the profile and the height of the nine story building. Next slide. And that section taking, uh, even though there's not gonna be a direct connection from the new building to the bank, um, the, the, two, the two buildings do but come together and there'll be a, a separation between the two. The, the only connection will be from the outdoor marketplace. So there's not uh, any, other, any other level will not connect to the, to the bank building. Next slide. 
and these uh, these icons here show uh, what we were thinking on, on how we treated the facade. Uh, there's um, from, from the ground from the ground facade going up. Uh, there is a uh, glass curtain wall with a fritted uh, pattern that highlights that multicolored uh, facade expression that, that we showed in these early diagrams where we took all of the colors from the American flag and created this color palette that we then transposed onto the building facade. And as you move up, we, you know, we've covered the, the parking with metal panels, and then we're opening up the terrace, the terrace level, the amenity level with a green roof. And then we have a dual tone um, fin pattern on the residential uh, levels that give you, uh, achieve two things really. One, um, as you approach it from the north, you have a, a um, multicolored um, color scheme that really celebrates the, the heritage and the identity of the community. And then from the South, you know, it, it celebrates the, uh, the history of the precedent set by the bank of a limestone color. Mm -hmm. Next. And then uh, here, just a zoom in of that unique floor that's in, that's in between the residential and the public. Um, you know, showing this large uh, terrace outdoor community space that will be available, you know, for the tenants to, to enjoy. And then just as I was mentioning with the views uh, from the upper floors into to Humboldt Park, again to mid-screen and to the skyline to the rest of the city. And I'll hand it back over to uh, Mike, Mike Perella. Thank you, Emilio. Um, this project, of course, will require, um, comply with all uh, necessary requirements for stormwater and um, and sustainability. And um, you know, we'll include a number of public benefits, uh, including estimated 450 uh, construction jobs and 20 uh, estimated permanent permanent jobs. Um, you know, in conclusion, the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, reviewed the proposal and, uh, and found it appropriate for a number of very good reasons. You know, it promotes a unified planning and development through design, uh, which fits in the character of the neighborhood and the surrounding buildings. It ensures a level of amenities that are appropriate in nature and scale of the project, promotes flexible application of development standards, and provides a creative urban design. Um, the uh, building abutting the sidewalk has doors and windows and active uses on the ground floor, it limits the amount of on-site parking, it seals it from the commercial streets, promotes uh, transit, pedestrian, and bicycle use, and ensures access, ex excuse me, accessibility for persons with disabilities and minimizes conflict with existing transit traffic patterns. It ensures uh, very much so that all sides of the project uh, that are visible to the public are treated with high quality materials, finishes, and architect architectural details that are appropriate for the uh, public right of way and public facing streets. And it promotes economically beneficial development patterns are compatible with the character of the neighborhood. Um, the project was re reviewed by, you know, CDOT, MOPD, and FIRE, and there's no comp as well as the Department of Housing, and there are no comments left unaddressed by the development team, and no issues. So therefore, the development, or, sorry, the Department of Planning and Development and the Zoning Administrator recommend that the Plan Commission uh, recommend approval of residential business PD to accommodate the proposed project, and recommend forwarding the application to the Committee on Zoning landmark and building standards. Uh, thank you for your time and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have along with the development team. Thank you, Mike. Do the commissioners have any questions of the staff or the applicant? Uh, Commissioner Soto. I had a question. Um, when you're looking at the affordable housing component, who? Who exactly are we um, are we targeting? Because I saw four bedrooms and three bedrooms. So those are I'm assuming that they have um, children, right? Like these are family units. So what what I've experienced um, firsthand, like working in the affordable housing areas, that parents have had to um, do adjustments to their units. One time I actually w w was inspecting a unit and there was a trampoline in the middle of the bedroom because there's, there's not enough you know, amenities in some of these buildings for the kids, whether it's exterior space or interior space. So in that shared amenity area, is there a component for um, kids to just burn some energy? 
considering the winter months of Chicago. Thanks, Commissioner. I'll take that one uh, and JGMA. Totally understood, Commissioner. Our thought on it was to make that amenity space, one, putting it where we put it was to keep it away from the ground level, but also we tried to make it as big, if you notice with the way the design kind of shifted, so it's not the same um, floor plate as the, the units above. We wanted to maximize how much private outdoor space there is up there. Um, so there's community rooms up there. There'll be space for kids to run around outside. We've looked at even adding a playground, but it just doesn't. Um, it just won't fit with what's, you know, with what you see here today. But uh, we think there is ample room for kids to run around in there. Can someone go back to the amenity floor so that we could see how they're managing that? It's uh, fourth floor, level four. Yeah, fourth floor. So we have uh, the community room, a tenant lounge, a game room, um, as well as the outdoor terrace. And we, we also put the laundry room down on that floor. It just if there's parents that are doing laundry, that way the kids could be close by um, and staying confined within the building. I, I know we're not taking, uh, we're not taking questions, but uh, you you are you are absolutely sure there's no way to get a uh, a protected uh, playground in the larger portion of the I guess the backside uh, near back uh, along the health center. It seems like it's uh, an ample space. We're we're not sure, Commissioner. It's just something we're still studying and okay. seeing how we can make it fit. Well, I think the point is being well made, and it is something that could be uh, added. Uh, or modified to the green roof strategy, because the point, uh, you know, point is well made. I can even be honest with you. I could see a a, a, a running track <laughs> around uh, this uh, space uh, if you think about it. So uh, I think the point is well made, and it might be something that the team might look at uh, in consideration because it is so wonderful to have family size units in this building, uh, which means there will be a lot of kids uh, for sure. Commissioner Reeves? Um, I think it's a beautiful building. I mean, truly, um, Juan Gabriel does develop beautiful, beautiful buildings. So I'm not surprised from that perspective, but I would like to know more about the affordable housing component. I know it was a general statement, the 85 units will be affordable, but I would like to see a breakdown of the unit types and the incomes that they're gonna target because I think it's important to understand affordable to whom these units are going to be. Um, and I, I totally agree with the comment made by both Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Soto. If, if you're looking to have three bedrooms, and I'm extremely surprised about the mention of the four bedrooms because I, I don't really see that. And, based on my understanding, and we serve Latin families, um, we don't see a demand for four bedrooms. And we're right now leasing an affordable housing project and we're having challenges finding families that will fit the criteria of a three bedroom apartment. So I would like to know where that comes from. And then clearly, as you're gonna have a significant number of children that everybody has said, I don't see that floor that you just show us as a space that is safe for children. Um, I, my preference would be to see children's activities on the ground floor. I'm always nervous about uh, terraces and balconies. Um, and so in all the rooms that you mentioned there are more conducive to adults, uh, given that you're also gonna have your health counseling component on that floor. So, I, I, I really hope that there is an opportunity to truly create some children's space um, on the ground floor, uh, as Commissioner Cox mentioned, you know, a running, I mean, a running track. I mean, uh, it will be, it is important. You are gonna have a lot of families and there are also gonna be families that are gonna be coming to the library. 
uh, which is also an asset. This is not going to be just for the families that are going to live in the building, but the families of the neighborhood. So there's got to be a safe, you know, recreational welcoming uh, component dedicated to children. Understood. Uh, but but is it possible to to answer the question about the four bedrooms? Because this is the first time I think I'm seeing uh, four bedrooms. Uh, I know people have advocated pretty hard for three bedrooms for families with children. But uh, when I heard four, I was like, like, uh, yeah, where is exactly is that coming from? And you know, uh, what happens if you can't you know lease those up? And um, you know, I, you know, it speaks a little bit to. Uh, the question I would also have is who who is going to own and operate the housing uh, for the duration of this affordability? Um, so anyway, I, I would be great if you could address. Um, sure, sure, sure. You know, and, I just didn't want to. It's more of a. I didn't. And also, I'm sorry. I would like to. I'm sorry, but I would also like to see the breakdown of the unit type and the income levels. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, regarding the four bedroom units and how those came to be. We, it was from feedback from the community meetings. Um, multiple people spoke up and said that they wanted to have the ability to get more uh, you know, units for larger families. And it's not a lot of units of the 85, 10 of them are set aside for four bedrooms. Um, and of those 10, um, or, you know, of those 10, uh, there are some for 60% and 30% AMI, like all the units. And I'm happy to share whatever the most efficient way of sharing that data we have as far as saying what the unit count. I mean, I can read it off if that works or if you guys want me to submit something, I can totally do it. Whatever's easiest. Yeah, whatever your preference is, you can say it verbally. I mean, here. I would I would actually, take if notes. you don't mind, I'd like you to read it off so that sure. we can understand. Sure, sure. Um, so 85 total units, um, 30 of them are one bedrooms. And of that amount, 27 of the 30 are set aside for uh, individuals and families at 60% AMI. Three of them are set aside for 30% AMI. The two bedroom units, there's 30 total of those as well. 25 at 60% AMI and five at 30% AMI. Of the three bedrooms, there's 15. 10 of them are set aside for 60% AMI units and five of them are set aside for 30% AMI units. And for the four bedrooms, there's 10 total, uh, and six of them set aside for 60% AMI, and four of them set aside for 30% AMI. And, and Commissioner Cox, to answer your question, we, we plan on owning, and owning the building, uh, and we're currently looking at multiple property managers. Uh, the firm that we've so far selected um, is a firm called Leasing and Management Company. Um, and they're assisting it. We're in the process of applying for LIHTC through IDA's round right now, and they've partnered with us on the application. Thank you. Commissioner Navarro. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thanks, Mr. Moser. I, I want to, one thing I want to note is I'm very glad to hear of the inclusion of 30% AMI units and um, really important in it. And it's actually, I think, to the degree you choose to retain any uh, four bedroom units, it would, I think that's uh, in many ways might be the only way you would be able to rent them. My, my understanding has been that often you get kind of a colloquial sense that there's a need but then as Commissioner Reyes noted, um, then when folks go to lease up, there's a real mismatch because as the units, as the bedroom count gets higher, the rent gets higher and the ability for folks who need um, to the degree there is a need for it, uh, there's a mismatch in that size rent and what they can afford. And so having that uh, be targeted to 30% is really important. If you haven't, I would also recommend just checking with some other affordable housing providers in the area around their experience of uptake on larger units and um, just getting a sense if um, you know, Commissioner Reyes's experience in Pilsen and in areas further south 
is in fact, you know, playing out for them um, in this community or, or in these areas, I think would be really important to understanding that. Understood. Well, I should add, we're also getting a market study done um, that'll you know, also verify the, the numbers that we have. Okay. But thank you, Commissioner. Well, if there were any other comments uh, from commissioners, uh, is Alderman Maldonado or staff here to make a statement or a letter, it's a letter on file? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Cox, I see your hand is up. No, no, I mean, is, uh, is, is uh, Commissioner Maldonado, who has been a big, big advocate for this project, uh, is he uh, there? Because we certainly would love to hear from him. Commissioners, I don't, I don't see him present. I, uh, I forwarded the invite, but I don't see him present. Okay. Well, I think I think I just wanted to, to say a few things. Just to, um, well, well, I guess before I, I make some um, summary comments, I, I was curious about the fact of uh, no connections between the parking and the Pioneer Bank, because the Pioneer Bank has a lot of outward facing functions um, in terms of the cultural, the Latino cultural component, quite frankly, as well as the um, headquarters of JGMA. If someone, I'm assuming some people are gonna come by car and they will want to park. Uh, and it wasn't clear to me how much is being reserved for non-resident uh, users. And then it's a little, it's probably a little strange that if you work at JGMA and you come by car, that you actually can't go from the parking. I'm not sure what your experience is going to be in terms of going down the elevator, coming out of the building, going back in the building, whether you know it's just that the floor heights didn't match and therefore you couldn't make a direct connection between the parking and the uh, bank. But I'd like to understand a little bit the thinking about how that parking is gonna be used and how people uh, navigate the circulation. Um, Matt, you, you want me to chime in? Uh, I could, Commissioner Cox, I could, I could help on. And if you just could give, go to the exhibit, uh, whoever is controlling the slides, so that we can uh, talk about it in context. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so um, going, um, you know, in the very beginning when we when we started uh, this building, it was, it was certainly something that we explored. Uh, we actually started with two levels of parking that. Uh, really was driven by the number of spaces that that the, not only the resident program was demanding, but also the office component. Um, and at a certain point uh, during the design phases, we we did switch back to one parking level, and the count that that we yield with the one uh, parking level only gives us enough to satisfy the residential uh, requirement. And and there's not much uh, not much left here for for bank uh, parking. So, so that's when we made the decision um, to, to not, uh, abandon that approach because it, even if we did get a few spots, uh, the, the, the amount of hardship to, to connect those two buildings from uh, mm -hmm. just even a construction type standpoint was gonna be, the, the cost of that was extraordinary for, for a few spots of connection. So I just thought, you know, I always wonder when we are doing transit oriented development proposals that relax the parking requirements for residents that, you know, you know, to not over park uh, those out of 85 is a lot of units and 58 all dedicated to residents. I, I don't know if that's going to bear out as a reality of people's car ownership uh, in terms of living there and it would be it would be unfortunate to have a big empty uh, parking uh, podium. Uh, because residents actually don't, you know, have that many cars and that it needs to, I, you know, again, I think that's more probably of a management issue in terms of how you, you manage the parking uh, resource. But um, yeah, I mean, you just want to make sure that there's going to be a demand for parking in the, the bank cultural center um, office space. And uh, somehow uh, I hope that the the, the management of the parking resource could be such that, you know, it's shared. Um, so uh, that said, I really just wanted to stand back for a moment and just commend uh, this team um, 
and uh, the, the, the unprecedented nature of this project. It is, uh, you know, it's a nine story building. It is by far the largest Invest Southwest commission. Uh, and to have it being um, this particular mix of uh, Park Row development, uh, you know, a Latino uh, led company and have JGMA uh, be one of the anchor anchoring um, tenants together with the Latino um, cultural uh, component uh, and a new library. I mean, this is, this is like the ultimate mixed use building um, that is uh, really testing the model um, of, of mixed use. Uh, and it's just come together really beautifully. And a lot of the programmatic mix driven by community dialogue. Uh, and uh, it's, it should be noted, <laughs> Uh, the city did not own the Pioneer Bank. It was in the hands of a legacy property owner. The city did not own the vacant lot that the housing is on. And so we really don't have a precedent for the city coming in and so aggressively taking control of a site that the community prioritized. And the city simply found a way to make that happen. So I'm really proud uh, of this park project in particular. I mean, I think it's it's going to be an award-winning uh, piece of architecture, no no doubt, and it's going to be a fantastic place uh, for people to live um, and come home to. Uh, and those families that live in the housing, their kids will be parked in that library, uh, you know. And to have that amenity for families with children is very very different than even some of the successful mixing of of uh, libraries with senior housing, for example. Uh, that's, that's great uh, to provide that juxtaposition between library and seniors, but it's even greater to have families with children that have a library downstairs. Uh, so just, and then of course the covered public plaza. I just, uh, I'm just really impressed with how the design team and the development team folded so many community priorities into this. It's just a flagship Invest Southwest Commission. I just congratulate everyone involved. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. So Commissioner Burnett, followed by Commissioner Navarro. I'm not sure if your hand is still up or if that's a hold order, over, but uh, Commissioner Burnett. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am so, so elated and impressed uh, with this, uh, this project. Um, you know, first of all, the team that put it together being so holistic. Uh, you know, I agree with all of the comments that were said uh, before me uh, in regards to this. This is just fantastic. You know, uh, this is not too far from the area I represent. Um, and the fact of the matter is uh, houses are starting to go for a million dollars in this area, quiet as it's kept. Uh, and people are getting priced out. Uh, to have an all affordable building in this community gives folks an opportunity to stay in the neighborhood where they, where they were raised and or they're raising their children. So I think this is, this is fantastic. I'd like to commend uh, my colleague, Alderman Maldonado, um, who's focused on trying to keep the culture of the Puerto Rican community and the Latino community in this neighborhood so they don't get pushed out. Uh, and he's doing a great job. Uh, he's really leaving a great legacy, uh, a great legacy um, behind as he get ready to transition out of this position. And I just, just want to commend him for everything that he has done in regards to this. This is a beautiful design. Uh, I, I just want to know, and I may have missed it, um, how how are you all making this 100% affordable? Is it tax credits? Are you getting ARO money? Uh, uh, what's the deal? Thanks, Alderman. It, the majority of it is tax credits. Okay, what is state tax credits? We're chasing the state one right now. Just their application round is open. Uh, they're due mm -hmm. on the 16th of February. And we're also looking at new markets um, to help with the some of the library costs as well. Okay, fantastic. And 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 this uh, so that makes what the everything sixty percent of uh, median income. It, it's a mix between sixty and thirty percent. 
20 of the 85 units, 20, 20% 20 of them are set aside for 30% AMI. The rest are 60%. So with the 30%, what are you getting, some uh, CH, CHA money? No, right now it pencils out without getting any vouchers. Uh, we haven't started okay. that conversation yet with CHA. All right. And, you know, and I know, um, you know that you guys got to jump through a lot of hoops in order to make these things happen. And it takes a long time to, to put this kind of funding together. So I just want to commend you all for doing this. Thank you. Um, you know, I think this is fantastic. Uh, it really hits the heart of helping people who need help to be able to stay in these neighborhoods. So congratulations. Um, this is just great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Burnett. Um, unless there's any other comments, I do have one comment. Uh, it uh, was good to hear, uh, Matthew, you mentioned that you would be uh, or are commissioning a market study. Um, I think it would be good for all of us to understand you know, um, if there is still, or if there are those demands for four bedrooms, you know, if that's a trend that we need to be paying attention to, if there, if that is the case, um, uh, it's also good to see. It's great to see uh, another uh, Invest Southwest uh, project taking that next step forward toward implementation. So I uh, just really want to commend you and the team, of course, the city as well as Department of Housing for moving this forward. And finally, uh, uh, coming from the design side, I have to say that it is refreshing to see. Uh, the Latino architect on the other side, working as a developer. It is a feel good moment for those in the design industry. And we hope to see more of these type of partnerships happening. So congratulations to uh, JGMA, Juan and your team uh, for being on the other side uh, of this effort. I should say being on both sides of this effort. So I just wanted to call that out. Thank uh, you, Chair. Now, if there were any additional questions from staff or the applicant or the alderman, uh, do I have a motion on a proposed Residential plan development submitted by Team Paneros LLC for the property generally located at 1614 to 1638 on Pulaski Road, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. So moved by uh, Commissioner Reyes, seconded by Escareño. Seconded by Escareño. Uh, if I can have a roll call vote. Commissioner Barclay. Yes. Commissioner Piazzi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfield is a yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Escarino. Yes. I'm sorry, Commissioner Brumfield is a yes. Um, Commissioner Flores has uh, accused herself. Commissioner Lienz. Sorry. Yes. I'm a yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Navarro. Yes. Commissioner Piero. Yes, right. In my Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Soto. Yes. Commissioner Tillman. Commissioner Tillman. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Sorry, Vice Chair, Commissioner Tillman's a recusal on this, sorry. Ah. Commissioner Wagaspai. Yes. Motion passes, congratulations to the team. With that, uh, I will pass uh, the gavel back to Chairwoman Flores. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Brumfield. Um, the last item on the agenda is item D3, a proposed waterway industrial plan development submitted by TP106 LLC for the property generally located at 2800 East 106th Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from PMD6 uh, Planning Manufacturing District 6, Lake Calumet, to a waterway industrial plan development. The applicant proposes to construct a vehicular storage area with uh, 638 non-accessory parking spaces. The overall FAR of the plan development will be uh, zero, and this is in the 10th ward. Uh, Michael is here and will provide the context overview, and the applicant will present their proposal. Um. Good afternoon, uh, members of the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Michael Penisnack, and I'm here today to present a proposed waterway plan development at 2800 East 106th Street uh, to allow for accessory parking. Um, no cargo storage is going to be taking place on the site, and thus it is not subject to the air quality monitoring ordinance. 
Uh, so this property is in the uh, 10th ward and I see Alderwoman Garza here. Um, so hello, Alderwoman. Um, it is also in the South Deering community area, which has a population of 14,105 people. The area is 63% black, 31% Latino and 5% white. Uh, it skews slightly younger than the city with 29.1% uh, of people under the age of 19, 38 percent between 20 and 49, 25 between 50 and 74 years, and then 6.9%, uh, 75 and over. Um, about two thirds of uh, the land in South Deering uh, is related to uh, transportation uses uh, like the proposal uh, before you today. Um, it, the other land uses in the area, it is approximately 10% commercial industrial, uh, 8% open space and 15% um, of just other uses, institutional, residential, mixed use, uh, and vacant. So uh, the subject uh, property is a gross site area of 37 acres and a net site area of uh, 29 and a half acres. Uh, this property is located in planned manufacturing district number six. It is immediately north of another waterway uh, plan development, 1155. Uh, that development for Edelman's truck rental uh, permits a much wider uh, range of uses than this uh, property, uh, including heavy equipment sales and rentals, motor vehicle service and repair, interior, exterior storage, and various kinds of uh, recycling facilities. Um, it is bordered by uh, the plan manufacturing district on the north, um, other portions of the south, and on the west and to the east on the other side of the Calumet River is another uh, industrial waterway uh, planned development. Uh, looking east on this site, uh, you'll see arrow, sorry, looking from west to east uh, on the north of the site, you will see Arrow Corporation. They're a uh, food manufacturing business. Um, the site slopes downward um, as you go from the river uh, to the southwest corner at 106th and uh, Muskegon. So if we look here at various views, um, you will see that this area woefully lacks uh, pedestrian infrastructure. In image two on the left, you will see there is no sidewalk at uh, Muskegon and 106th on the northeast corner. Then in image three and four, you'll see the same thing um, reflected uh, where you do not in image three on the right uh, have a sidewalk and in image five uh, near the curb cut on the right side of the screen, you do not uh, have a sidewalk. Uh, the Calumet Land Use Plan uh, published uh, February 2002 um, has the preservation of industrial use in the area, balancing that with open space as one of its goals. And the Calumet design guidelines uh, published two years later, uh, give guidelines on soil hydrology and how to implement um, a more prairie uh, landscape that is natural to the area. Uh, this plan development does follow uh, those guidelines as the applicant will uh, demonstrate. Uh, so rather excitingly, uh, the vice president uh, visited uh, the 10th ward um, earlier this, yeah, earlier this month um, to announce that the 106th Street Bridge, which is adjacent to the site, uh, will be receiving uh, a large federal grant, um, as she uh, said at uh, the announcement event. At these bridges, we will build dedicated bike lanes and better sidewalks so the people in South Deering and Eastside can walk or bike to work instead of drive if they wish, which saves them money and is better for the planet. We'll eliminate load limits for trucks and improve the bridge race process so that more boats can carry goods up and down this river. And so businesses can ship more products to market. I am happy uh, to uh, introduce uh, Tyler Manick of Shane Banks, Matt Eagle and Kevin Coughlin of Manhard Consulting, uh, Brad Dethloff, of Rolf Campbell and Timothy McHale and Jim Kurtzwale of Transport Properties, uh, who will uh, begin their portion of the presentation. 
Um, Michael, I, I really apologize, everybody, for interrupting. And I know this is a little um, out of sorts, but um, I, I was wondering if you might bend the rules a little to allow me to speak. I have a 1230, and I'd really like to just um, give my two cents on this project, if that's okay. I apologize. Please go ahead. I think uh, we understand there's Thank you. Uh, schedule conflicts. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Flores. I appreciate you very much. Um, um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It's nice to see everybody's faces. Hi, Commissioner Escarino. Um, so I, I um, this is a project that we've been working on for almost two years. This property has been vacant for a very long time. Um, I would just like to say we held two community meetings with the South Deering com community on this project to let, let them know um, what was happening. Um, I'm very excited to take an old industrial site that actually has had significant environmental cleanup already. There was flu dust and arc dust that was um, dumped there that was re, you know, remediated and taken out. Um, this company is gonna be planting over 450 trees and 1100 shrubs, um, as well as 5.5 acres of landscaping and including all along the perimeter of of all four sides of this site. And they are, will also be restabilizing the shoreline. Um, the owner is constructing a new sidewalk along 106th Street for easier access to the CTA bus routes. I know the, the, um, the driveway is gonna be moved over a little bit to the west. Um, they are gonna be performing over a million dollars in environmental cleanup there. Um, and clean up the, you know, the industrial uses of the past. And they're gonna actually invest $15 million into this parcel. Um, this is gonna bring much needed jobs to our community and turn an eyesore into um, something that we can really be proud of. So I just wanna show my support for this project and thank this company for taking a chance um, in the 10th ward and bringing jobs and um, actually you know, developing something into nothing into something. So. I just wanted to show my support and thank you very much for allowing me to speak. You guys, I appreciate you. Thank you, Elder Woman uh, Garza. Uh, Michael, would you like to continue with your pre presentation? I mean, what more is there to say? Um, <laughs> but this, uh, I'm happy to have uh, Tyler Manick uh, from Shane Banks uh, kick off uh, this portion of the presentation. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Tyler Manick. I'm an attorney with Shane Banks, Kenny and Schwartz. As Michael mentioned, I'm joined by Tim McAhill and Jim Kurzweil, who are principals of the applicant TP106 LLC, who owns the subject property at 2800 East 106th Street. Uh, we are also joined by Kevin Conlon, Matt Eagle, and Brad Dethaloff with Manhart Consulting, who are instrumental in designing the plans that you'll see shortly. Uh, as background for TP106 LLC, they're a local Chicago-based developer specializing in developing and enhancing properties to provide industrial outdoor solutions. The applicant works with local, regional, and national tenants. TP106 LLC has acquired, or has acquired and developed 36 properties containing 421 acres of parking and 9,348 parking spaces in the Midwest over the past three years. TP106 LLC seeks an industrial waterway plan development at 2800 East 106th Street to improve a nearly 37 acre vacant parcel adjacent to the Calumet River with vehicular storage area of 631 non-accessory parking spaces for truck and trailers. Under this plan development, vehicular storage is the only use being proposed at this location which would be entitled in the plan development. Other uses such as container storage will not be allowed under this plan development. Leading up to this presentation, uh, as Alderwoman Garza confirmed just before, we've worked closely with her, her office and she confirmed her support for this project. Uh, in addition to Alderwoman Garza, the applicant has also met and worked with the River Ecology and Governance Task Force Development Review Team which has been delegated the task of coordinating between government agencies, civic and nonprofit organizations, private developers and local communities to achieve common goals for the betterment of Chicago rivers, which Kelly Met River is one of these. And as Alderwoman Garza just shared, uh, this project had a robust community meeting 
where these plans were shared to the local community. Finally, I would like to thank the department planning and the various city departments that weighed in on this project uh, to design a plan that you will shortly see and to ensure that this project, which it is compliant with the Calumet design guidelines, which is the planning document apl applicable to this site. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Eagle at Manhart Consulting, who's gonna walk the commission through uh, the plans. Uh, thanks, Tyler. Uh, yeah, just again, for the record, I'm Matt Eagle. I'm a, a civil engineer with Manhard uh, working on the development. Um, what we're looking at right now is the development site plan. So just again, for orientation, uh, we've got 106th Street on the south. We've got Muskegon Avenue on the west. We have the main channel of the Calumet River on the east. And then we have an existing barge slip off the Calumet on the north, as well as industrial um, also on the north. Um, so what we're proposing is the creation of a 631 space truck and trailer yard. Uh, this will have stall sizes that range between 55 and uh, roughly 73 and a half feet in length. Um, site setbacks for the development are based on the Calumet design guidelines, as Tyler just mentioned. Um, this requires a 30 foot setback along all street frontages, 20 foot setbacks along all interior side yards, and then a 30 foot setback whenever adjacent to the Calumet River, if that use is non-river dependent. Um, I think it maybe came up earlier uh, that we were at zero feet, um, but we actually do have a plan that's, that's exceeding all of the... Um, setbacks from the, from the Calumet design guidelines. Um, as Michael mentioned previously, the site is located in the city's far south side. Um, so we made sure to implement um, features of the Calumet design guidelines into the site. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So in regards to transportation um, perspective, we've worked really closely with Bill Higgins of CDOT and then more recently with, with Kevin McGinnis to build a plan that's consistent with CDOT's uh, rules and regulations. Um, we believe that the development is going to create a safe and efficient circulation of motor vehicles, emergency vehicles, and also pedestrians um, within and also adjacent to the site. Um, the site is a single access along South Muskegon Avenue and also a single access along East 106th Street. Um, in addition to CDOT, we've also worked with Chicago Fire and John Javorka to make sure that we're complying with all uh, fire and emergency vehicle codes. Um, and then finally, as, as the Alderwoman mentioned, uh, we're extending a new sidewalk where one currently doesn't exist. Uh, along East 106. This would be within the north right of way of East 106th Street, um, which will also help provide better access to some existing CTA bus stops uh, that are just south of the site. Uh, next slide. Um, so now we have the landscape plan. Um, this was designed to promote green space and seed mixes and plantings that are consistent with the Calumet design guidelines. Uh, we work closely with Ron Day and the city landscape department to come up with a planting plan for the development. Um, again, as, as was mentioned previously, the, the site as it currently exists today is uh, largely gravel and slag fills with limited and often no landscaping. Um, so what we're doing is, is trying to enhance and add more landscaping to improve the area. Um, one of the first major items that we're proposing is a shoreline stabilization along the east side of the site where we're along the main channel of the Calumet River. Uh, this will both stabilize the existing bank and also enhance some of the unique riparian features of the site. Um, also on the north side, again, I know I mentioned it before, but we are meeting the 30-foot non-river dependent setback on the north um, and, and landscaping it uh, consistent to the Cal design guidelines. Um, we're also utilizing low profile prairie seed mixes along any area where parking or vehicular use is proposed. Um, and the goal here in the guideline is basically just to provide continuity with other developments in the area that are also subject to the, to the Calumet design guidelines. 
Um, and then finally, the the landscaping um, is is slightly different in the streetscapes uh, according to the Cal Cal design guidelines. So uh, we're we're doing things like clustering trees and also providing grass parkways um, just to further support the natural design scheme of the entire Calumet industrial corridor. Uh, next slide. Um, there's really a number of sustainability features uh, that we're implementing on site. Um, some of these are listed here. So one big one is electric vehicle charging station that we're adding. Um, we'll also be planting the perimeter of the site with uh, bioswales um, and also obviously the landscaping in the buffers. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll be using LED lighting, uh, which is all dark sky certified um, throughout, the, throughout the lot. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of sustainability, we've worked really closely with Brad Roback um, to make sure we're achieving as many sustainable matrix points as possible. Um, a lot of the, the points in the sustainable matrix policy are building related. Um, there's no building on this site, so it, it makes it difficult to, to get some of the points, um, but we've identified uh, some good ones that, that we're showing here. Um, some of those include uh, the working landscape uh, policy point, which is essentially exceeding the 60% native or a 60% native uh, species requirement. Um, we're also meeting the natural landscape uh, guideline, which is uh, being achieved through the restoration of the east side of the site where we're adjacent to the, to the main channel of the Calumet. Um, I mentioned earlier, we're installing an EV charging station, and then we're also able to meet the 80% uh, waste diversion of construction and demolition uh, debris. Uh, next slide. Um, so we had the opportunity to take the proposed development um, to the River Ecology and Governments, or I'm sorry, Governance Task Force. Um, over this, this past summer. Uh, so that group provided feedback after our presentation for the site. Um, and I've lifted, or we've listed some of the bullet points here um, that were results of that presentation. Um, in an effort to meet some of these recommendations, we are providing bioretention zones for stormwater management uh, to filter out oils and other pollutants uh, along the perimeter of the site. We're also providing stormwater best management practices for road salt and other chloride pollutants. Um, we're also committed to using petroleum-based asphalt products in lieu of coal tar, uh, which will greatly reduce, uh, sorry, greatly reduce PAHs. Um, and then finally, uh, as mentioned with the landscaping plan, where we're using uh, native species um, and a mix of submerged and emergent plant species within the naturalized river edge on the east, uh, just to ensure a robust planting plan that's consistent with uh, the goals for the, the Calumet River Channel. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, sub, or this development's obviously subject to both the uh, Chicago Stormwater Ordinance and the Cal River Guidelines. Uh, so we worked with Andrew Billing and the stormwater team to, uh, to make sure that we're coming up with a plan to satisfy both documents. Uh, the primary goals uh, in relation to stormwater for the site are to facilitate infiltration of stormwater wherever possible. Um, that way we can filter particulates uh, prior to, to outletting into the Calumet River. Um, and then a, a third and final major goal is, is the stabilization of the existing uh, east shoreline. Um, the, the overall stormwater goal is essentially to just convey water from the center of the site to the perimeter bioretention areas, which are sized uh, to exceed the city volume control requirements. Um, and then, you know, finally, the, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the east bank of the development is, is going to be stabilized and seeded um, along the shoreline to, uh, to help with erosion. Uh, next slide. Um, so finally, I, I think a couple of these were mentioned by the Alderwoman before, um, but just to summarize some of the public benefits that would result in the development, um, the client's 
investing over $15 million uh, for new improvements and up to a million dollars in environmental soil remediation. Uh, we're adding five and a half acres, actually over five and a half acres of landscaped area, uh, which includes 450 plus new trees and 1,100 new shrubs, uh, and also providing shoreline stabilization to a portion of the main channel of the Calumet River. Uh, the sidewalk was mentioned before as well. Um, I've taken, or I will take advantage of that uh, during construction as a bus user. Uh, we'll be providing a new public sidewalk along the north side of East 106th. Um, we're also supporting regional logistics with over 600 uh, trailer storage spaces uh, for the region and specifically the uh, Calumet Industrial Corridor. Uh, and then finally, the development will support uh, over 600 jobs and it'll meet or exceed all the developer participation goals. Um, so I'll send it back over to Michael for the final DPD recommendation slide. Of course. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, wonderful job. Um, the proposed, so uh, the Department of Planning and Development is uh, respectfully requesting a favorable vote on the proposed waterway industrial plan uh, development at 2800 East 106th Street. Uh, the proposed development is in compliance with the plan development standards and guidelines, um, including what you saw there. I also wanna call special attention to uh, plan development should reduce the speed and contamination of stormwater runoff flows from a site and for waterways, um, provide adequate setbacks or bulk storage facilities to prevent littering or leaching of pollutants into the waterway. I will reiterate, uh, this is not a container uh, storage site, but nevertheless, they provide that kind of uh, anti-pollution measure. They also, uh, Include stabilizing treatments for waterway edges uh, with landscape screening for visual relief and safety provisions for any uh, lands side and water side users. And they provide landscaping within all waterway setback areas with trees and vegetation that are compatible with and enhance the riparian environment. Uh, the team representing uh, TP106 LLC and myself are happy to uh, take any questions the commission may have. Thank you, Michael. Um, I do have a question. I know there was uh, a reference to the 30 foot setback uh, on multiple instances. Is there a plan that we can go back to and just point where that 30 foot is taken from? I know it was a concern on the east side and the north side of the site. Yeah, um, I'm probably best answering this. So it's it is a little small, and I apologize for that. But um, the the landscaping shown with a green cross hatch. Mm -hmm. So the green hatch at the north, it's you're you're gonna have to take my word for this. Uh, it's it's 40 feet and 42 feet uh, on the there's a dimension at the at the west, kind of in the northwest, and also in the northeast. Um, so we're exceeding it by 10 feet. The Cal River guidelines get a little more complicated on the east side because the 30 feet is actually taken from the top of the bank mm -hmm. on the north side there's an existing seawall so it's it's 30 feet from the from the seawall which would be the top on the east side we have green space areas that are actually closer to 60 feet in areas but we're we're only considering um the, we're grading up to a top of bank and then going 30 feet off that in order to, to get the setback there. Okay, no, that helps. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Wagenspack, uh, followed by Commissioner Brumfield. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, first, I just wanna say this looks like a, a great uh, rehabilitation of this site. Um, and I'm glad Alderwoman Garza, uh, Sadowski Garza was able to speak and just kind of tell us a little bit. I, I did have some questions for her earlier, which she answered. Um, the 450 new trees, I think is outstanding. Um, you know, and it sounds like it'll be a good mix. Um, the, and I think you answered most of the other questions about the dark sky with the LED positioning. Um, 
On the PAHs, uh, did you choose to use the non coal tar, or was that something that um, you could speak to a little bit? I know it's cheaper to use the coal uh, based tar, but um, what led you to choose um, a better product, petroleum based? I, I could probably answer this one too. Um, a little bit of both in all honesty. So it was a recommendation from the river ecology and government uh, governance task force. Um, we reached out to a couple contractors who were, who were bidding the project and just asked, Hey, what are you, what are you planning on using this? Or uh, what are you planning on using? Is this acceptable? Is this feasible? And they were in agreement that it's, that it's doable. Okay. Did you, but it was, was it a lot more in terms of cost or? I don't, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, uh, I, it, it was TP who, who was bidding it out. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm not totally sure. I, I yeah, can do this one real quick. Uh, uh, sure. In all of our lots, we, we try to avoid the coal tar. Uh, we're trying to do a sustainable job in our parking facilities. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the city should ban them, but um, the, the project overall looks looks great. Um, I think you guys did a great job. I know this is a lot of parking space, but the way you've planned it out and I think the diversity of those those trees and the other shrubs that you'll have in there will really hopefully set a precedent for other uh, redeveloped lots over here throughout the future. Um, and uh, I think that's all I had, but um, just want to compliment you guys for the work that you've done on this and hopefully you, uh, you know, set the tone for the future for the area and congratulations. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Brumfield, followed by Commissioner Soto and then Commissioner Tillman. Uh, yes, I guess my only question, uh, maybe have two, uh, is still related to step back. I, I know that um, you, uh, did give some additional uh, clarification on uh, how you were addressing that uh, and spoke to where you were exceeding it. But uh, this graphic still makes it, at least for me, very much of a challenge to understand, you know, where, you know, you are exceeding. Uh, and I just would like to, you know, um, see, you know, another graphic that clearly shows, you know, uh, the setback that you're adhering to where you are exceeding. And also just to, you know, this is just my personal uh, kind of feeling. I think, you know, uh, I'm certainly supportive of this use. It's good that this uh, uh, piece of land uh, would be or will be uh, developed for a better use for this uh, particular part of the corridor. Um, but, you know, I also have concern about the precedent that this may set as it relates to uh, that landscape setback. Um, I know this is still adhering uh, to the uh, guidelines uh, that were uh, part of the plan uh, for the corridor. Uh, but I think in special cases like this, it would be good to see if we could actually do something more uh, to kind of shield, you know, not only the parking lot off the river, but also on 106th Street. But I, again, I think uh, I, I would like to see another graph that clearly shows uh, where that setback begins and where you are saying that you're exceeding it, because uh, it's just really hard to follow in this graphic that's on the screen right now. Michael, uh, hi, this is Kevin Coglin with Manhard, um, and I understand the question. Uh, Michael, is there, do you have the ability to zoom in on the north edge of the site? Let's find out together. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So, um, Andre, the, the, now, I think it may be a little more clear. The edge of the seawall at the slip um, is at the the end of the arrow saying 30 foot minimum Calumet River setback. And, and then now we can see the, the 42.6 and the 40.3 um, where we've, we've pulled off of the river's edge. Um, there was some some back and forth earlier in the project as to whether the more industrial intended use of the slip was was the river's edge, um, and I know initially we were we were a lot closer, um, but as we worked through uh, the process with DPD and sustainability and, and landscape, uh, 
we decided to pull it back, you know, the 30 feet plus an extra 10 um, at that location. Mm -hmm. And then if you, uh, Michael, if you can kind of pan to the south uh, so we can see the, the edge of the Calumet River, got to zoom in on the east side of the site. Uh, the, uh, we're, we're looking at 50, 60 feet. Um, you know, I know we don't have dimension arrows there, um, but if we can, maybe if we can see the, the slip setback also in the view, just to, by spatial comparison, um, if we zoom to the north, you can see the, where, where 42 feet, uh, would lie and and if you kind of translate to that that to the east side you can kind of see you know or even the 73 foot dimension we're, we're even pushing that uh setback and again that was to give you know provide some more space to do uh something attractive and uh, and sustainable with shoreline improvements and and also prevent erosion uh because calumet river is, is connected to lake michigan uh, so we needed some space for for some robust erosion protection, um, as well as to provide the the beautification factor for for views along the river. Commissioner Brentfield, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, but still, probably uh, for me, I'm working a lot harder to to understand what this I guess means along the riverfront, and again, where that setback does start. And also where you're exceeding, uh, but also I, I do feel that uh, regardless, uh, it, it would be good if we could, um, uh, and maybe this is where the city does come in. You know, probably revisits you know specific guidelines uh, for the setback along the river for this these type of uses. Again, very much supportive of the use. Uh, really appreciate you know the areas that you have treated from a landscape standpoint in terms of the planting and the effort that's gone into there. Uh, but just again. Uh, uh, still somewhat concerned about the precedent that this may set in terms of the minimum setback that that, that is required. Uh, it would be great to see something that, you know, starts to, you know, exceed something more, especially along, um, exceeds that uh, beyond along the river and also 106th Street. Agreed. Very good point. Um, Commissioner Wagenspeck, do you still have a follow-up comment? Uh, no, Chairwoman, I'm sorry, I didn't take a hand down. Okay, then we have Commissioner Shilto next. Um, I had a question more on the environmental portion of this, because we're talking about, you know, um, removing soils. I didn't see um, a section of the parking surface and how much subgrade are you removing? Are these soils above the subgrade that are you removing? And are you doing the bare minimum required of uh, removal of unsuitable soils? There's a lot to my question. So. The parking surface, is that acting as an engineered barrier? Are there additional engineered barriers that are required that divide up that space and your landscaping area? Just so that I have a complete understanding of exactly how much environmental um, issues are being addressed. Because we know that when you're removing environmental contaminants, it can be the bare minimum just needed for your excavation, or it can be for any future developments where you're going and digging deeper and taking items out. Yeah, that's that's a good question, um, and I can I can start with it. Um, a lot of the the environmental remediation that has been done up to this point um, was prior to us jumping on, and it was looking at hot spots and removing those soils. The way that the civil aspect of it is designed um, is we're we're trying to basically uh, meet the grade at the existing perimeters of the site, and then get up as high as we possibly can to kind of create a cover over the existing soils. So that way we're not just tearing a bunch of soils out when we don't really need to. Um, that that's, that's kind of the main, one of the main earthwork goals as well, just to, to balance the site. Um, and then I don't, I, I don't know, uh, Jim, if there's I another color part here. before that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, essentially we hired a civil engineering consultant, CEC is our environmental consultant. And uh, I apologize, uh, Commissioner Soto, but I'm not, 
uh, highly technical and environmental. We tend to oversee outside consultants, uh, but our firm always um, uh, strives, like I said earlier, about the type of asphalt we use. We do strive to do the right environmental thing. And I know we've worked, our consultants have worked with the Illinois EPA on this site. My high level understanding is that we had, I think, uh, three or four hot spots, they call them hot spots, where we proactively dug into the dug into the ground, removed those dirty soils, had them hauled off to a special offsite landfill uh, uh, facility for environmentally hazardous substances. And then we backfilled those uh, sites with clean fill. And then the Illinois EPA also sees the benefit to this pro uh, project of all of the capping that we are doing with the new asphalt and the landscaping also counts uh, as an acceptable cap. So we've worked very closely with the Illinois EPA. And Jim, just to elaborate on that, after um, we did uh, remove the soils, we did retest in those areas. And on two of the hot, four hot spots, we actually dug deeper because they were not satisfied with the levels that we were taking out. So after we dug out, we didn't just backfill right away. We did retest it in two situations, dug and hauled off more soil prior to backfilling and the EPA signed off of that prior to us doing that. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that everyone on the call understands you know, what that means, that you're, you're following the EPA regulations um, to what they recommended we're not, you're not necessarily doing something that is uh, required above and beyond. And you will be following whatever recommendations. And I believe you will have a no further remediation letter um, from the, the EPA. And any subsequent developments may have to also invest in future um, environmental um, you know, items. And just to note on that, to elaborate on that further, we weren't required to get an NFR letter. Um, that's something that we do as a company. Um, you know, as you said, we want to be able to, to take it to closure and the whole process that we're doing, we should, you know, it just takes some time after the closure, but we expect to have the no further remediation letter sometime after development is completed. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Tillman. Thank you. I uh, was wondering, I, I definitely appreciate the aspect of, of all the landscaping that is being um, carried out um, really at the edge of, of the property. My question is regarding the interior um, of the property and the expansive asphalt that we understand is going to be um, located here. And so has there been been or was there any um, consideration to interior plantings um, to be able to break up that amount of, of asphalt um, within the interior of the, of the project? I yeah, would I, uh, defer to Matt. Yeah, I was going to say I can uh, start on this one. Um, I know the the uh, landscape ordinance is, is based on the, the, no, the amount of pavement that you have. Um, so early in the process, we looked at our landscaping requirements, uh, compared those to the functionality of the site. Uh, we've noticed sites like these, you know, you've got, you've got trucks and trailers maneuvering. Uh, you're, you're at the, the mercy of, 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 of drivers to a certain uh, respect and the landscaping, interior landscaping just does, doesn't have a strong chance of success there. Uh, so what we tried to do is take a holistic approach and really focus on and putting all the, the plantings and um, landscaping requirements and doing something around the perimeter of the site, but primarily just as, as that's the, the location to that, that the plantings will have the best chance of uh, sustained success and where we expect them to, you know, to thrive. Thank you. Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you. This has been very helpful. Uh, and uh, thanks as well for um, older, old woman Garza's uh, comment. One of the one of the things I heard uh, in the public testimony was that there was no community meetings. Uh, and I think that 
it sounds like it was a mischaracterization uh, because uh, Alderman Garza said that there were two community meetings held uh, around this project. So that was a, obviously a, a big concern because I know we have an obligation uh, to public notice uh, and the old woman who is um, really always understood the, um, these uses and how, um, how to move economic development uh, that is relevant to this particular area forward. But usually um, she's really a stickler for public engagement. So I was a little uh, surprised that it was being characterized as not having had it. So having that issue um, cleared up, um, I did have some question a little bit about like who are going to be the users of this. Um, how did you determine the number of truck and trailer, um, the capacity? Because it does feel like you are filling it out to getting the maximum number of spots, but I'm not quite sure what's driving uh, that those numbers. Who's going to be using this? So that's one question. And then the other is, I think, to uh, Commissioner Brumfield's point, you know, you uh, have involved uh, engineers that have laid out the plan uh, and kind of met the minimum requirements of the ordinance, uh, but it's still hard because uh, to understand what the visual impact of this is um, coming off of the bridge along 106. I still don't know if with the uh, 400 trees being planted, are we still going to see um, 18 wheelers parked there? Or is the that number of trees so robust that no one will even know that this is um, uh, what's being parked by this? So that's an elevational, that's a perspective, a view from the bridge. When you're on that bridge, what are you going to see? Are you going to see a really robust uh, tree uh, um, buffer, or are you going to see, you know, some shrubs and some grasses and 18 wheelers parked behind it? And so those are easy things to show uh, in terms of visual exhibits. We don't have any of that. So I actually don't know. Uh, I know you're meeting the requirements, and I think that means that, you know, you've met the requirements. Uh, so I can support this, but if somebody on the street said, do you know what you're getting? Uh, I would have to say, no, I don't. Uh, and that's not a good position for the commissioners to be in. And that is simply uh, incumbent upon the applicant to show us what we're getting, not just provide us with a technical drawing that says we meet the letter of the law. Uh, so those are my two points. Uh, I'd like to understand uh, how is it that you determine uh, that this was the amount of spots because effectively if you were parking fewer you probably would have space to put more landscape instead of having a 30 foot setback you might have been able to have a 60 foot setback um, and so uh, that's the one question then the point is like I still don't know if what you are doing is going to shield this use from the public coming along 106. Kevin, can you or Matt uh, talk about the the visual on 106th, and then I'll follow up with our plans for the site? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my, Michael, is there a is it possible to show a couple exhibits um, that were? And I apologize; those those were included in. Uh, the river, river Ecology and Governance Task Force. Um, there was a, a, a 2D landscape exhibit, and then there was a an exhibit that showed uh, a section view along the river. I um, will pull up, um, if I can stop sharing my screen, I will pull up uh, your River Ecology presentation and find uh, those exhibits for you. Is that okay the, with the- As uh, an alternative, I don't know if we can share our screen, uh, Matt may be able to grab those too. While you guys are figuring that out, I could uh, uh, talk in uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Cox uh, about our plans for the site. Um, you know, our firm is uh, Transport Properties LLC. We're based here in Chicago, and uh, our mission is to kind of clean up and institutionalize uh, the very high demand for 
storage of trucks and trailers in the new economy. Um, so uh, we've done several projects like this, uh, in, uh, mostly within drive time around the Chicago area. Um, and every time we found that the demand uh, ex exceeds what we what we have supplied to the market. So um, th this project is a relatively large one for us, but we're confident that uh, there is enough demand in the area for um, storage. I mean, you can just anecdotally, you can see it driving around you see trucks that are parked in residential areas that probably don't belong there. And it's because they can't find uh, places to park like this. So, uh, but what you can expect and what we've seen in our other projects is typically um, a lot of our projects, a single tenant might come and lease the entire property. Um, it could be UPS, it could be FedEx, it could be the, you know, uh, the various people that are uh, delivering packages to our doorsteps. Um, but uh, this is a relatively large property. So we we are prepared that there might be multiple tenants here, but for the most part, they're going to be organized, you know, trucking companies uh, that, that are needing space in the area. But we do not have any specific plans. This is speculative for us, but we've got a lot of experience doing this speculatively. So I think it would, that's very helpful. I think it would quite frankly be helpful for me uh, if you could, uh, you know, forward to, uh, um, uh, our staff here, some of the other um, parking, um, you know, truck and trailer yards uh, that are under your uh, ownership or, or management, so that I can understand again, um, you know, just what this looks like. Uh, and then the other question is, you know, what is the visual impact um, of this? Are the trees and uh, the kind of uh, uh, vegetation going to be such that you know, if the uh, 18 wheeler is, I don't know, 15 feet tall, that um, the trees will be 20 feet tall. So nobody will see it. So I just, I don't have a good sense of that. Michael, were you able to get a hold of those exhibits? I am searching uh, my folders now. Um, if Kevin, were you also searching for those for uh, Commissioner Cox? Yes, um, I've got I've got them up. If My, if it's possible, Michael, you can also go to the River Ecology Task Force and pull the presentation off of there if you need to temporarily. But we should the staff should keep the control of the presentations. It, okay, tech, tech support has uh, controls in place for a reason. Sorry, unfortunately, we've had some bad experiences. <laughs> So the last version sent by Tyler actually had this this really nice color slide. Um, I think it was maybe just too large, uh, the, the file size issue. But if you go to the last um, the last slideshow sent by Tyler, it would have been page twelve of that. Uh, this is tech support. I just enable everyone to be able to share. So with okay. Bob's permission. Because, yeah, the PDF, um, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues who forwarded me the PDF on the River Ecology uh, website that I now have up um, and can share. But, yes, no, it took a while for that PDF to uh, load. I also want to make sure, um, for example, when they visited River Ecology, um, they did not have... Uh, you know, the sort of buffering that they have today. So I don't want that to uh, throw anyone off. They really took uh, our feedback on landscaping okay. uh, to heart. And so I believe um, I am just going to pull up. Uh... Michael, and we're still not seeing your screen in case you, okay, now we are. Yes. So this is, um, what had been uh, submitted to River Ecology. Um, if uh, Matt or Kevin want to go into this, just sort of. Yeah, sure. Um, this, this, uh, this shows against the, uh, the slip on the north side, uh, the, okay. the seawall view. Um, and I was just trying to, I was just trying to share just so we get the, the view I'm looking for 
And it, I guess to back up, am I able to uh, to share? There is a different document that um, or that we would like to show that shows the full view. Kevin, and it's I, Noah. Go ahead. The tech support has enabled you to share. Go ahead and share your presentation. Uh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know this would be such a uh, <laughs> enterprise here. <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> Not a problem. One one good thing that uh, came out of COVID, I guess, here. Uh, hold on. As I say that, I'm sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, can everybody see a, the plan view, color plan view of the site? Yes. We can. Okay, great. So this will, I think this will help with the context for the setback uh, to Commissioner Brumfield's comment. Um, so it's setback is from the existing top of bank, uh, which is essentially vertical and eroding by the day. Uh, so that's, that was where the 30 feet is measured from. Um, you can see the, you know, we, we listed the 30 foot minimum uh, we're up in that 50, 60 foot range. Uh, but this is what this is what you're looking at from the Calumet River and from the from the bridge. Um, as you can see, the the landscaping and trees will come around and meet uh, and, and, and tie into landscaping around 106th um, and our stormwater open space area or our storm stormwater bio bioretention area not necessarily considered open space. Um, but we, yeah, we did put these, these renderings together um, and follow the, follow the Cal River guidelines for, for plantings, um, which taken in, in Chicago landscape code, which take into consideration uh, your commercial and industrial uses and it has heavier landscaping on the perimeters. Just a note on that cross section too, the, the scales are missing on it. it. It is to scale, but it's a different horizontal and vertical scale. Um, so it, it's it's showing yeah. it looking a lot closer than it actually is, but yeah, the-, I, the actually, I see why it wasn't included in the exhibit. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little confusing, but uh, I think the point, I, just the point that I you know made that, you know it seems like consideration has been given to the view of this coming off of the bridge and along 106, which is going to be the most uh, a kind of aggressive view shed. Uh, and, you know, guess when the planting material, I don't know if they're going to be, you know, evergreen or deciduous or what, um, will do its job uh, to make sure that this corridor gets uh, greener uh, and it has a, a sustainability component. So uh, I think I think I've gotten what I what I wanted. Uh, uh, although again, I, I would underscore that I think you know having views from the 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 pedestrian or the vehicular experience uh, would be an appropriate exhibit for for such a uh, such a project. Um, and that's just something I think from uh, our staff will uh, know to ask for those further exhibits in the future as we uh, evaluate these kinds of proposals. Uh, thank you. Thank you, noted on our end also with the perspective, the picture can tell a thousand words. Yep, thank you uh, everyone. Um, Commissioner Wagensback. Thanks Chairwoman. Um, I was just looking through a couple of things. This is more of a question for maybe Noah or Patrick, but um, when when we're listening to this, we had we heard of the uh, River Ecology and Governance Task Force, and I know that that document was updated in 2019. Just looking at um, what's on the website right now, the Prairie Guideline uh, guidelines were approved in 2004 by the Plan Commission, and those were made back even years ahead of that. Um, there were a couple other sets of guidelines there. And then the online version that I see for the city landscape guidelines are from 1999. Well, uh, wait a second, 2000, but I think they were done in 1999. So um, 
I don't know which guidelines uh, supersede other ones, but maybe Noah or Patrick could let us know what what is um, the priority for each one of these. And obviously, if it's in the Calumet area, that that applies to it. But are, are we up to date on all of these other design guidelines? And maybe I'm just not seeing on the website what is there because I see Mayor Daly's name on the one that's officially up there. Yeah, so that's about as long as Lake Calumet guidelines have been around. And I think that that was part of the points that, the, sorry, it's Noah for the record. Uh, the commissioner was trying to make is that maybe it's time to sort of revisit these and modernize these a little bit because they have not been, the Calumet guidelines have not been touched in, in some time. But there are, there are two. So the landscape ordinance in and of itself covers the city as a whole, with the exception of this area that's, that's delineated as the Lake Calumet guidelines. So Lake Calumet is, you know, an area that has more, a spread out landscaping. It has a lot of these areas where you have these storage areas, truck parking areas, things that are you know, need to have larger setbacks, need to have more open prairie type areas, um, have areas where I think, as you heard the team here say today, it's difficult to put landscape right in the middle of truck locks or in the middle of logistics lots, they won't survive. So it, it allows for and took into account the heavy industry that has been in this area and how to sort of make it harmonious with the requirements of the ordinance. They couldn't, they couldn't meet the ordinance uh, at these sites. So they, they both are, I mean, in terms of hierarchy, the hierarchy here is the Lake Calumet guidelines control. Um, but that's a, that's a floor, not a ceiling. So anyone can certainly look at ways in which they can exceed that, that, that floor and put in more uh, with the amount of care and, and careful installation and maintenance care that's necessary to then keep them alive after they do that. And Noah, is um, is it up to the CPC? Because I know the CPC approved the Prairie Guidelines in 04, but um, is it up to DPD or is it now the River Ecology Task Force that meets, I think, quarterly or month, maybe even monthly? I know I've, who who is looking at the guidelines now to say, you know, for instance, uh, Mr. Kurzweil said that they voluntarily went with uh, petroleum-based asphalt. You know, so, is that something so, we can we you as a staff would look at and say, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna change these guidelines, and I'm just using that as an example. We're no longer using coal-based um, tar in our guidelines. So, so that's a great that's a great question, and I think it has it's a, there's a twofold answer to that. So, the River Ecology Task Force serves as an advisory panel to the city, so they help us look at sort of trending things, uh, changes in engineering, changes in technology, things that get us to a better level of sustainability citywide and help bring those things into projects. Uh, then the twofold approach is we have both, as you know, being a council member, policies that are drafted sort of to guide and then ordinance, which is our mandate compliance. So I think the step here would probably be, next step would be Commissioner Cox's point, is revisit the guidelines, come up with a policy that is a little more in line with things that have changed over the last couple of decades since the first one was implemented, and, and then use that to guide towards projects. And then if, if the desire is there or if the necessity is there, implement ordinances or strategies that are even more strict to go beyond the policies if they're not being followed. Sounds great. I, that's, I was looking for you to kind of recap that and put the three together you know, just for an explanation. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Cox. Yeah, I, I'm just, I know we're uh, getting ready uh, for a vote, but uh, just to underscore, you know, um, I think we have this notion that since these various guidelines were adopted, uh, that we've moved forward and we have a greater understanding of the tools available to um, do sustainable uh, development. And we have not undertaken a uh, comprehensive look to say, you know, what does um, what does an industrial district along the Calumet look like in the 21st century? And it, everything from the, the surfaces to the uh, percentages of, uh, of, 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 of land, landscape coverage, I think we should do that. So, you know, the, the applicants are, you know, um, designing towards our standards and they're meeting the letter of the law. But if it feels like 
you know, this looks like it's 20 years old, standards of 20 years old, then that's incumbent on the city to have a conversation with the, that industry about what is the new and best practices uh, that still are economically viable for them uh, to develop the site. I think that is something that we are poised and should uh, do, and that this is an excellent um, test case. Because I mean, anything that hasn't been looked at for 20 years, I think we've got a problem, right? <laughs> uh, we really need to be refreshing these standards every five years as a minimum. Uh, and so I think, you know, um, uh, I appreciate the, the, the work uh, that the uh, applicant has done. And uh, once again, um, you're just following our guidelines <laughs> and you've met them. Uh, and so uh, I, I feel very comfortable in supporting it, but I, I really do feel that we have to uh, look again and think about wh where we want these uh, districts to go in the 21st century, if we want them to go further. All very good points. Um, and I think we're ready for a motion. Uh, so with that, do I have a motion on a proposed waterway industrial plan development submitted by TP106 at LC for the property generally located at 2800 East 106th Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Uh, so I'll make Commissioner Cox. Okay, second, motion John. by Commissioner Cox, second by Commissioner Wagensbeck. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Um, I believe Commissioner Barclay had to step out. Um, and we also have a proxy vote for Commissioner Biagi uh, as a yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brumfield? No. Okay. Commissioner Burnett, are you still here? Commissioner Burnett, we can't hear you. We'll come, we'll come back to him. Uh, Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Abstain. Okay. Commissioner Murphy? I'm not hearing a vote. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes, I believe had to step away. Yes. Commissioner Soto? Abstain. Okay. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Maybe he's gone. Uh, Commissioner Wagensback. Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Congratulations to the team. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, this concludes this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. So moved by Escareño, uh, second? Second. By, okay, second by Lyons. Uh, let's do this. Um, who's still here? Commissioner Brumfield. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox. Here, yes, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Commissioner Escareño. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores, yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara. I see yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Soto. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman. Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Wagensback. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is now adjourned at 117. Thank you and Thank see you, you everyone yeah. next month. Thank you. Thank you.